so that we can start from uh, where we had left. So uh, last time what we did was uh, we, do, we said research is basically divided into two aspects, inductive and deductive. Inductive research is the bottom-up approach where uh, you uh, reach to the shop floor, reach to the respondent, try to find out how the particular construct is being understood by the respondent. And then um, uh, through focus group interviews, Delphi techniques, nominal techniques, try and understand and draw out certain dimensions. Uh, this has to be backed up by um, deductive research, just as we know that today we are in the era of mixed methods research. So mixed methods or triangulation method is uh, reaching out to a conclusion by using multiple techniques, multiple methods, such that the conclusion that you're drawing is robust enough for uh, people to follow. So uh, in the deductive research, there are different aspects to it. Deductive, as, it, as the word itself says, it is top-down approach. So top-down means whatever work has already been done uh, in the area uh, should be now sacrosanct, should be categorized, and you can study it under different ways and means. So there are different methodologies of conducting the deductive research. So the first one and the foremost one, which um, all of us know and all of us need to do is literature review. Literature review, again, is of multiple types. So there is narrative review, there is meta-analytical review, there is scoping, there is traditional review, there is a, a systematic literature review. So for people who are into scale development and which is uh, the concern of uh, uh, concern for me today uh, in this workshop, since this, is, this that is the area that we are studying here, uh, SLR or systematic literature review, again, is of two types. And uh, going for uh, systematic literature review calls for picking up on either of these uh, types. The first type is called as domain-based review. The second is called as method-based. And the third is called as theory-based. So if you are trying to systematize the construct on the basis of Methods, that means all that has been done so far in terms of uh, different methodologies being used, uh, you can go in for a uh, uh, method-based review. For instance, uh, there are multiple tools uh, in statistics and uh, marketing research, business research, that you can apply uh, to reach out to a construct differently from different perspectives. So... Um, even investor behavior, uh, you can actually run a conjoint analysis to find out how the investor, what, whether the investor, what is the probability of success? You know, you can run a logistic uh, regression to find out the probability of success. Similarly, you can do a conjoint analysis to find out what are the factors or what is the combination that is more suited for in, um, uh, investor behavior in different categories, in different segments. So yes, uh, we can apply different methodologies for the same construct, for the same study. And that is the reason we conduct the methodological review. Then, of course, we come uh, to conclusion where we are talking about uh, theory-based review. So every construct is not a standalone construct. In fact, it draws from multiple nomological networks. Nomological networks, just as we said yesterday, that when we are talking about uh, us, when, we are, I'm, when I'm talking about me, then I belong to a family structure and that is my nomological network. So people who are similar to me, people who are in, uh, akin to me uh, would be in that nomological network. Similarly, a construct would have its own nomological network. So, um, for example, performance and uh, uh, skill and uh, recruitment and training and uh, development would come under the same nomological network. Similarly, uh, different uh, student well-being, if you are studying well-being, then nomological network may be derived from psychology, philosophy, um, organizational behavior, management, and uh, say education and many other fields. So uh, what is the nomological network? You can also do uh, based out of different nomological networks. You would have different theories that you would like to study and then come up to a conclusion as to what suits you the best. Now. Uh, having said that, we are now coming up to uh, the first review, what is the most important review, which is uh, which is now going to be uh, basically talk, we are talking about the domain-based review. So when I'm talking about the domain-based review, if I remember, I just did it yesterday. I will just go through it if we can go through that slide again. Yeah. 
So uh, when we are talking about the uh, domain method or the domain based review, there is first which is called as the structural review. So putting up all your literature review tables into some coherent sense. So what do you mean by coherent sense? Uh, we mean that we club all the Western authors together. We club all the Eastern authors together. We club how many people have been talking about the outbound nature of the construct, how many people have been talking about the inbound nature of the construct, and you try to uh, deal with it. Then the second is called as bibliometric review. Bibliometric review is basically citations, trends, countries, how people have been studying the constructs. What is the uh, gamut of things that people would like to uh, talk about when it comes to uh, these uh, trends and citations? So, yeah, that is bibliometry. But what I am concerned on is uh, the kind of review that we are uh, based out, which is framework-based review. So, coming down to what is a framework-based review, a quick recap, there are different types of frameworks that you can follow. I already showed you a paper yesterday where we have given you a methodology of whichever framework you would like to pick up. And there are different types of framework. Depending on the uh, type of study, nature of study, you would like to pick up your framework. So the first framework is the PCCM framework, that is theories, context, characteristics, and methods. The second framework is the ADO framework, that is antecedents, decisions, and outcome. The third framework is the IMO framework, which is uh, input, mediator, outcome. Input is nothing but the antecedents again here. Then we have this 5W plus 1H framework where you are talking about what, when, where, how, and why of things. And then you can even combine these networks uh, to form TCM ADO or probably TCM IMO, depending upon which framework suits your type of study. So uh, for scale development, for dimension analysis, what we are trying to do is we are coming to TCM ADO. This is these are these two are the most preferred if you are into scale development. Uh, a brief, brief recap of scale development. We said scales can either be available in the market. That means available in the public domain or not available in the public domain. In case they are available in the public domain, then you can use them directly as is, which is called as adoption. But you can't break the scale. You have to take the entire scale and go ahead with it. If you're to talking about a standardized research, if you're just talking about picking and choosing certain statements from here and there and uh, citing those authors, that's definitely not scale development. That's definitely not. You have just prepared a questionnaire with certain questions on your dimensions, but it is not scale development. So uh, scale development is a different terminology altogether, which actually helps you to contribute to the body of knowledge. So um, contribution to the body of knowledge is a big, big thing when we are talking about uh, academic research and uh, India has been falling short in it uh, since long. But nowadays, everybody, I mean, I'm talking about in the entire globe, we are moving towards contribution to the body of knowledge. And trust me, scale development papers are a big in demand uh, kind of a thing. That is the reason so many workshops on scale development. So scale development, uh, here when I talk about a scale, I'm talking about a standardized scale. I'm talking about a scale which has a reliability and validity which is well in place. Reliability is the consistency of measurement. Consistency means every time when I measure it, it's going to give me the same result. Validity is the questions are measuring what they purport to measure. That means if you're asking questions on student well-being, then the, all the questions that are pertaining to student well-being should only be asked and general well-being questions should be avoided. Or for that matter, employee well-being, personal well-being and other well-being questions should be avoided. So uh, there is where we are talking about reliability and validity. A reliable and valid scale if you are taking uh, directly. That is, you are trying to use the scale as is. So we were talking about the adoption, adaption and uh, the... the uh, different uh, ways in which you construct the scale. So first is adopt, you use the scale as is. That means all the statements, uh, probably the sample that you are studying is also similar and you don't want to change the statements at all. You want to take, take the scale as is. In such a case, you would not like to do EFA because the scale is already developed. The factorization is already complete by the author and you not uh, don't need to do the factorization again. All that you need to do is check whether it validates for your sample or not. So what we are trying to uh, do here is we are trying to go in for uh, CFA and not EFA. So we will go only for CFA and adopt the scale as is. Otherwise, we can adapt the scale. This is about a little tweaking of the questions here and there. 
so as to suit the sample. Now, when I say tweaking of the questions, it doesn't mean that you will uh, change the essence of the question or the soul of the question. What you are going to do is maintaining the essence of the question. We will try and see that it suits our sample. So if you're talking about uh, happiness questionnaire, which I have developed for, say, students, and you want to apply on faculty, then you will introduce uh, the uh, perspective of the faculty in terms of changing those questions, but such that the essence is not lost. In such a case, also you do only EF, uh, you do only CFA. That is, you need to validate the scale again for your sample. That is about it. So uh, you will not apply EFA here. It is not required. However, when we are into scale construction, now this is a big, big, big process. It requires a lot of steps. Here we are talking about EFA, CFA. Here we are exploring the factorization. We are doing item analysis, dimension analysis. Then we get go into validation. Validation is also not just limited to the measurement model or uh, the, um, the CFA. It is uh, you have to go in for content validation, um, uh, you know, criteria validating, uh, validity, face validity, uh, then nomological validity, generalizability. So you have to go in for different steps when we are talking about scale construction. So uh, that means when I'm doing my systematic literature review, wherein I have to talk about uh, the, uh, the, you know, the concepts of how I start, where do I start from? So I have, I have started basically from inductive research where I got my keywords. So here is where I got my keywords pertaining to my uh, construct. Who gives these keywords? These keywords are basically given by experts, which through a, FGD, which is a focus group discussion. So for my, um, I developed a scale with my uh, co-author and my scholar on student well-being. So when we talked about student well-being, we set up a set of experts, which included all the stakeholders. So you have to have students, you have to have teachers, you have to have parents, you have to have, uh, since we were talking about professional students, so we had industry experts, and uh, we also talked about the RM experts, so research methodology experts. Why? Because it is a scale development process and it actually requires all the expertise that an RM expert may have to give to you. So this is where uh, we started with inductive research. And uh, through inductive research, we then moved up to deductive research. So here we got the keywords. We put these keywords to... Um, uh, Web of Science and uh, Scopus databases, we applied, uh, we did a systematic literature review, which was basically uh, domain-based, and we uh, basically uh, tried to do it and apply a framework-based review. So in the framework-based review, we applied the TCM and ADO framework such that, such that all the theories pertaining to the topic can be studied all the uh, context pertaining to the topic can be studied. All the methods that the topic has already applied can be studied. All the antecedents, we are talking about the antecedents to the topic can be studied. And we also, the most important aspect, now this is where our scale development is going to uh, find its place. This is where we are talking about the description or the decision or we are talking about characteristics or in other words we are talking about the dimensions that or the definitions how authors have defined that particular topic so we were talking about student well-being under consideration construct uh, we were uh, doing scale development and construction for student well-being so all the definitions and dimensions that were there and of course we did not want to lose out on the uh, outcome so the outcome variables are very important again because they help you to give the uh, dependent variable for the construct so that you can do use a uh, generalizability. So for generalizability and for nomological validity, we might even need the outcome variable. And that is where uh, we need to study the, this particular framework is perfect for, um, uh, for scale development process. Now, every SLR has an objective. And what is the objective? SLR and domain-based reviews should help you to identify one, gaps, two, research questions, 
and three research objectives. Of course, if you understand this entire process of uh, this particular cell is again dependent on uh, it, it's 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 like a process itself. So from the gaps you come to research questions, and from the research questions you come to research objectives. So here we are identifying uh, research gaps from SLR and also doing a very important exercise which is called as dimensionality. We are also in the process of dimensionality. Dimensionality actually derives itself from uh, the dimensions and the definitions that have been provided by the TCM ADO framework. And this is where we will get our uh, solace in terms of the deductive research. So if you realize we have uh, applied a mixed methods here where you're talking about inductive and deductive both for skill development. And that is the reason it is more robust also and more accepted also in the international academic circles. And uh, uh, the best part that it's going to give you is your research questions, research objectives and dimensionality. Now, research gaps. What are research gaps? Usually, uh, people identify with research gaps from one paper or two paper. So what do you do? You uh, pick up a paper and you say that uh, uh, this particular construct has not been studied in, pers in uh, perception of or in perspective of, say, the academic industry or the education industry. Now, in such a case, um, you will not... Uh, uh, you will not be able to uh, justify that gap because that is just a preliminary gap. It is a gap which is which is basically not. Uh, it's a gap where we are not talking about uh, uh, the real crux of why we are going to do why we want to do a particular activity. So we need to be very clear on what kind of gaps we would have and what kind of research questions can come up from those gaps. Let's take a quick recap on what kind of gaps we can have and what kind of research questions can come up from these gaps. So if you realize there are seven types of gaps that have been uh, provided and uh, these um, have been given by Saldia and McCoy in 2011, uh, reiterated by Muller in 2015 and Miles in 2018. So um, the first gap that we talk about through your SLR. Now, please note that all this has to come from your SLR. You will talk about the evidence gap. Evidence gap is results from the studies allow for conclusion in their. Uh, just a second, let me just. Uh, huh? Just a second. Yeah. Yeah. So, results from studies allow for conclusion in their own right, but are contradictory when examined from a more abstract point of view. So, uh, you know, people may be uh, studying well-being only in terms of uh, what all evidence has already been there, has been there in well-being. For example, um, people might be talk about, talking about physical well-being. They may be talking about emotional well-being. They may be talking about other well-beings. But has anybody talked about uh, how well-being uh, may be uh, uh, correlated or uh, may be defined in terms of, say, universities or university satisfaction? or the kind of support that they get at the universities. Now, uh, the results from the studies are concluding in their own area, and all the results are concluding in the same area. So the other areas which have become relevant, for example, student well-being uh, after COVID has actually introduced the concept of online learning. So student well-being at the juncture of online learning, earlier there was no online learning. Uh, we were only into uh, the classroom methodology, and the well-being of students at that particular point in time was very different from what it is today because the kind of uh, interaction, the emotional bond that the teacher can share with the student here on the online platform is very different from that in the offline setup. So there is an evidence gap because there has been a change in the uh, scenario how people are looking at it. That knowledge gap. Desert research findings do not exist. For example, um, uh, just as I told you, the digital uh, divide of uh, and the digital acceptance of uh, is a very important uh, variable uh, for defining student well-being, which might not have been, uh, which was not discussed because initially it was not as important. Another thing that came to our, um, uh, you know, uh, forefront was 
that uh, people have not been talking about resilience and people have only been talking about well-being in terms of absence of burnout, absence of stress. So is the absence of stress equivalent to being well-being, if well-being in the state of well-being? So knowledge gap. Uh, there is where we are talking about a void that is existing, only one direction has been studied. Then uh, we are talking about methodology gap, action gap, practical knowledge gap. So probably people have been talking about it, but nobody has come up to a conclusion in terms of uh, how can you measure it? How can you calibrate it? Nobody is talking about that. Empirical gap. Now, all that has been done hasn't been empirically verified. So we are talking about that uh, subjecting well-being is very important for a student. Resilience is very important for a student, but it has not been verified. So you would like to empirically test. Theoretical gap. Now, sometimes what happens is um, the basics, uh, theoretical underpinning is has not been identified. For instance, people are talking about different kind of theories that apply to well-being. So um, there is a theory which is called as SGT. So uh, SCT, social cognitive theory. So social cognitive theory says that there are environmental, behavioral, and cognitive forces which impact your well-being. So People have only studied the environmental forces. People have only studied the behavioral forces. But what about the cognitive forces? The cognitive forces are a very big force, especially in case of, in case of uh, professional students. For example, am I employable is a cognitive uh, force. That's, that's in your mind. That's, that's the uh, constant um, uh, recurring thought that is, uh, uh, is, is problematic for students of this this yana. So uh, there is where you need to understand the theory application and people haven't applied any theory to it. So SCT actually helps us to identify the different gaps and what can be the probable antecedents when I'm formulating my um, uh, when I'm formulating my model for running student well-being. And then of course population gap. So uh, people may have studied it under the schools and the colleges and they have not uh, or the vanilla uh, courses like BMA professionally it has not been started so that will be one of the cases but see here the future research directions also you can get through uh, these particular gaps this table has already been uh, uh, included in the paper that got published in the A category journal internal journal of consumer studies where we talked about what were the antecedents and what kind of gaps they highlighted so through the TCM ADO, I came to know the macro level predictors of student well-being have not been studied. So it's only micro, just as I said, only psychology, psychology, psychology. That's where they have been harping on. When you talk about university satisfaction, there is a knowledge gap. No work has been done to assess it, empirical gap. So on the basis of the knowledge and the empirical gap, I get my first five research questions. And what are these? Does SWB or student well-being vary according to the national economic situation? and state of the labor market. Does it actually vary? So if you're talking about a market where we are talking about students in the online mode, does it vary? So work from home or study from home concepts, which is a macroeconomic variable, does it vary? Which inclusion interventions can improve the well-being of marginalized and underrepresented students? So uh, you've been talking about inclusivity and uh, diversity very, very recently. People were never into it. So uh, is inclusion diversity impacting the well-being of students, especially from the underrated areas or underrepresented areas? Then how can nurturing relationships, student-teacher, teacher-alumni, student-student, be developed in higher education to foster well-being? So all, the, all through these years, we have been talking about well-being as my state of burnout or stress. So it is very personal to me. However, we realized, according to the SCT theory, so the theoretical gap was no theory was applied. We applied the SCT theory and we find out it's not just the personal factors. It's the environmental factors plus the behavioral factors. So what are the behavioral factors? How does my teacher behave with me? How does my co-student behave with me? How does my alumni relate to me? Do I have a team in the college? So yeah, these are the factors that might impact the study of well-being on a different note. Then on the basis of the dimensions of general individual well-being, we had knowledge and empirical gap. So uh, you would be surprised. In fact, yesterday, uh, if you were with me, I showed you on Web of Science portal as to uh, only 219 papers which are appearing for student well-being, even till date. So people haven't even defined it in a proper manner. 
so the dimensions of well being there is a big knowledge and empirical gap so what is the underlying dimensionality of student well being is what we would like to find out and uh, that, that is the reason the ado framework out of the ado d is very very important outcomes implications for higher education how can it help and uh, does swb lead to higher level of career resilience does swb lead to better uh, behavior in terms of word of mouth that the student could have for the other students so these are the pertinent research questions which should give future research directions from your slr paper so slr paper should have this particular table because unless you have this particular table you are not heading anywhere so you remember we uh, we talked about uh, gaps and research questions which otherwise will help you to uh, formulate research objectives later on dimensionality so here we are talking about dimensionality if you see this particular uh, this particular uh, row it is talking that there is definitely a knowledge and empirical gap and we need to find out the underlying dimensions so what is cause there are other gaps also i will not go through them they are just mentioned here for you now so now we come to what is called as dimensionality what is dimensionality let's understand this so when i talk about dimensionality here what i am trying to do is make an excel sheet and what does this excel sheet say remember dimensionality gave, gave me different definitions or it gave me different characteristics or it gave me different dimensions or it gave me different probable factors which people thought are important to be included so what i do is on the x on the rows i put up in the first column i put up my dimensions so i put up my dimensions so subjective well being is one of the dimensions resilience is one of the dimensions physical well being is another dimension then career well being is another dimension and you may have different dimensions there may be a list that may be there uh, with you depending on how many papers you have surveyed now on the on the first row in different columns you would have author 1 author 2 author 3 and all the subsequent authors and now we do is a multi dimensional scaling where we map author 1 now that uh, we have done the literature review it is very clear that author one is not just talking about one aspect of well being so what all aspects has author one talked about also you will realize when you are studying a particular uh, construct there are similar authors who will keep writing about the construct over the years so a1 talked about uh, uh, subjective well being say in a particular year uh, he also talked about career well being in his recent paper A two talked about uh, subjective well being and resilience. A three talked about all of these put together. Uh, A four talked about so on and so forth. Now, what I get out of this table is if I total up this table here and here, so I total up this table here and I total up this table here. So the total here, if I every tick were to be considered as one, the total here is going to give me. the value or the importance that each of these dimensions has so how many papers are talking about subjective well being as a dimension will be coming out in the number here also how many papers how many uh, times that the, the author one has referred to student well being and how much work has he done in the area of student well being will come here so this particular table helps me to identify two things one who are the prominent authors because you will need them you will need them later when you ask them uh, different queries you may even like them to become your rm experts for your focus groups when you are doing your skill development so who are the prominent authors who have been working in the area and you should also scan their work that uh, whether or not they have created the skill in student well being or not and second thing that it gives us is a uh, importance of all the dimensions in terms of papers that are discussing those dimensions this is with respect to papers that is research so on the basis of the research papers we get the importance of the dimensions that is the total here 
x total x gives us the uh, importance of the dimensions and y here gives us the uh, prominent authors or uh, how much a particular author has been working in a particular area. So now uh, coming down to a dimension table, a dimension table would look something like this. This is a brief dimension table that I have shown you. If you realize um, uh, subjective, this is for student well-being. Uh, subjective well-being has been uh, been referred to by these authors and it's about 71.4% um, uh, times subjective well-being appears as a definition whenever people are talking about uh, student well-being, right? So uh, when we are talking about student well-being, uh, just, just a second, okay. I thought there is some. So when we're talking about student well-being, uh, psychological well-being was the next important dimension, which had 57.1% and then followed by the other dimensions. Uh, having said that, uh, a very important variable was career well-being. Now, career well-being has not been talked about by many authors. Why? Can you see that? A career well-being is just 10%, uh, if I have read it correctly. Just a second. Career well-being has uh, just been talked about, uh, 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 say, 10%, 10.7%. But uh, for a professional uh, student, it is very logical to have career well-being because uh, we're talking about MBAs and BTECs who are, uh, whose uh, basic ideology and stress is uh, deriving itself from career well-being. So should I pick up this particular dimension to be a part of my important dimensions or not? How do I do it? So the first thing that you need to go is you need to go back to your FGD. Here is uh, where you will come back to the FGD. So now I will, uh, what I will do is now that I have my uh, dimensionality in place, I will conduct the second FGD. The second FGD is conducted to find out the important dimensions that I need to identify with. And not just the important dimension. That means my selection of dimensions as to what the uh, what the uh, respondent, the real stakeholders feel are important. But also, I may have to add on certain dimensions which may not be supported by literature and are uh, coming down from practical practical insights of practitioners. That means I am just not limiting myself to literature. I also want to have practical insights of practitioners. Remember, we had industry experts here. So all the practical insights that these industry experts uh, need to give us should also be incorporated when we are talking about the second FGD. So now I will uh, introduce you to, I will just show you. Uh, just let me show you this. Is the Excel sheet visible to you? Is the Excel sheet visible? Yes, please. It's this. Yes, ma'am. It is visible, right? Yes, ma'am. Just a second. Okay, so if I talk about this Excel sheet, uh, this is uh, a clear cut. Uh, uh, this is how I get all my work done when we are talking about PhD. We have our master sheet where we calibrate everything that has come down to us from literature review or from different uh, subsequent sources. And I will show you how we do it for PhD. This is just an aspect of PhD that is skill development that uh, we've been doing. So here we have this these dimensions. Now, do you realize there is emotional well-being and under subjective well-being, these are the sub-dimensions. So, under subjective well-being also people have been talking about uh, positive emotions, positive effect, negative effect, happiness, life satisfaction, university satisfaction, course satisfaction. They are talking about uh, loneliness, optimism, hope, envy, stimulation, passion. So, all these, uh, these are the different authors who've been talking about these sub-dimensions. So all this is clubbed under the emotional well-being or the subjective well-being. And these are the number of authors that we studied 
this is about 312. And you realize that the 47 papers talk about the uh, emotional well-being as a, as a very important fundamental dimension. So uh, this is the total. The total on the uh, uh, total on column A B O gives us this particular column. The total here gives me my uh, this particular column gives me uh, all that I need to know uh, in terms of which have been the most important dimensions as far as student well-being is concerned. Now this is a very very uh, massive uh, work. Uh, this particular uh, work has been done in, in a very detailed format. You need to now calibrate it and concise it. Now, how do I, uh, what do we need to do to calibrate and concise? So, uh, if you realize, we will go up to, can you see the totals here? Can you see the totals on row 68? Now, this is the total that is actually uh, highlighting. This is the total that is actually highlighting the authors who have been very, very prevalent in the area of uh, well-being. So uh, uh, this is our most favorite author. So on BL and the BN. So BL and BN, uh, you see, see the number of ones they have done. So they've continuously been working. And uh, to tell you the truth, we even contacted them when we did our item generation. So uh, this is where we are talking about the detailed dimension table. Now we come to the brief dimension table. Now what I need to do is I take this up to the focus group. Focus group means my experts. And these experts are going to now talk about uh, the different uh, aspects of student well-being. So when I took it to the to focus group, uh, just a second. So this was the dimension table. This was the brief dimension table. Now, what we have done is from this elaborate dimension table where we had all the all the authors and all the uh, sub dimensions being mentioned, we created a brief table on the basis of the uh, the clubbings that can be done um, in terms of say there are certain happiness, positive effect, ne uh, negative effect, emotion can all be clubbed under subjective well-being as per literature, not as per me, not as per my scholar, but as per literature. So we have clubbed it and we have made our major dimensions. Major dimensions are subjective well-being, psychological well-being, social well-being, physical well-being, resilience, and all this. So again, this dimension table has been uh, very properly uh, uh, created in terms of percentage coverage. Now, this is a more concise table which can tell you the basic, the major ones that we need to uh, talk about. So uh, beyond this dimension table, what I do is I uh, try to write the subjective, well, the name of the dimension, the definition of the dimension. Kya matlab hai iska? Subjective well-being. It can be gauged from individuals' cognitive judgment of their life and their affective experiences. So two things it is um, calibrating. Cognitive judgments and life experiences. So life experiences in terms of university, life experiences in terms of with teachers, life experiences in terms of your classmates and everything is calibrated here. So you would see uh, things like university satisfaction, course satisfaction, post effect, absence of negative effect, happiness, envy, optimism. So these are the sub dimensions. Now this has this is the final dimensions uh, that we uh, we took this entire set to the focus group and we asked them as to you please tell us how do we select and what all do we select. So the focus group came up to a conclusion that these should be the final dimensions that should be selected. But when they were talking about these final dimensions, they said what you have not included are the two dimensions that you can see in green. They said you have not included personal academic balance. Now, how do you define personal academic balance? So, um, uh, balancing between study and social life. They said your uh, your students, especially in the uh, in the uh, management and the technical arena, are so hell bent to get a job that uh, they are unable to balance their studies and social life. Either they are only studying. There is a segment of students who are only studying and there are a segment of students who are only having fun. So um, the balancing act is missing because what the corporate actually needs is the balance because there's going to be stress and there's going to be um, uh, ways and means that a person should be able to uh, fight that stress that is there in the, uh, in the uh, environment that he's going to be in soon. 
So uh, that is where we are talking about personal academic balance. This was an element that was introduced by the industry experts, a dimension that we hadn't got in literature, but we added on. Another thing that um, they said that uh, your uh, students, especially the BTEC students uh, lack is social inclusion. Now, uh, most of us do not have a feeling of being accepted by the society. I mean, um, of course, uh, how and what is the reason they are actually your uh, basis of why the well-being is not at that level. So it can be childhood trauma, it can be many, many things. So we can, we're can not getting into that arena. But social inclusion, again, came from one of the uh, psychology experts who said that social inclusion is a very big phenomenon that is missing and that is where uh, the dimensions of uh, student well-being should be accentuated with. So then we came to item generation. Now, what is item generation? Item generation is, okay, I, I forgot to tell you uh, yesterday that when we are doing uh, uh, different types of uh, skills, when we are talking about different types of skills and we are formulating our questionnaire, so we need to be very, very careful as to uh, to be including certain things in our questionnaire, which which we which we which we were talking about here. Another variable that we forgot is called as a global variable. You know, this also should be included in the questionnaire. What is a global variable? In case our scale happens to be formative, so we need to include a variable which is actually covering the gist of the formative variable. For example, if you're working on happiness at work, then the global variable for you would be, I am happy. Simple. I I, I, uh, I think my well-being as a student is uh, fine. I, I am happy with the well-being that is there uh, for me as a student. Now, global variable is a very important phenomenon that should be included at the time of literature, uh, at the time of questionnaire design only while you're doing your item analysis because unless you have this global variable, you will not be able to run the convergent validity for formative skills. So please remember, for now, we are going to do global variable in detail, but for now, please remember the global variable also needs to be included in the questionnaire. Sort of out from demographics to scales to control, marker variable, and global variable is the next important thing that we've been talking about. Coming back here. So uh, here we start when we are finding the items. What are items? The questions that we thought of uh, for uh, giving in this particular uh, segment. Now, see the questions. The first question that is talking about is the global variable. I have a fulfilling life as a student. That is global variable one. As a student, I am satisfied with my well. Aapka, uh, you know, pura construct defined career. The entire construct is defined uh, in terms of uh, uh, this particular variable. So it's like um, puri zindagi ka essence, soul. Agar ek sentence mein bolna ho, that will be my global variable. So my global variable is um, uh, for if I'm studying happiness, it is I am happy. If I'm studying work-life fulfillment, uh, it is that I think my life is uh, fulfilled, both at the personal and the, or you, I, I think I am living a fulfilled life. So just a totality, just the essence is mapped by the global variable. So this is where it is. Then we had subjective well-being, the definition of subjective well-being, and the sub-dimensions of subjective well-being. Now it became very easy for us to make questions pertaining to subjective well-being. For example, university satisfaction was one of the uh, sub-dimensions of subjective well-being. So I'm satisfied with the quality of faculty, uh, structural resources, extracurricular activity, academic aspects. And these were the questions that we started asking. So we prepared these questions and uh, we had a list of about uh, 70 questions that were uh, made on the basis of the FGD2 the dimension selected at FGD2. So we are at stage two where uh, we were talking about FGD2. Let's come to that uh, in slide where we were talking about FGD2. So I don't know where I have missed it.
I would request the admin to uh, mute these people. Okay, ma'am. Okay. I'm... Only these two, not all. Okay, so uh, when you're talking about the second FGD, we talked about important uh, uh, dimensions and plus added dimensions. So you remember I showed you the list where there were important dimensions plus the added dimensions. Now I have led to questionnaire preparation. So I have done item generation. Here, this stage is called as dimensionality. And beyond dimensionality, I have to go to item generation. Once I have done and generated the items, just as we did here. So we have generated about 70 items which are talking on the basis of the definitions that were provided to us. Uh, and uh, which we uh, which we got from the uh, from literature review and also from the sub dimensions that were there. We also talked to the few uh, experts and we added on few dimensions and that is how we came up to 70 questions. Now, who's going to tell us whether these questions are right or wrong? Have I made the right questions? Have the questions actually purporting to measure what we want to measure? Is the purpose met? This particular, this particular phenomena is called as face validity. So at the face of it, I want people to check uh, that uh, we are, whether we are um, right, going in the right, right direction or not. Are the questions uh, rightly framed or not? So what I do is I go back again to the focus group. I now have the third FGD. So uh, this is my third FGD where I am going to be talking about item analysis or Item analysis through face validity. Face validity. Are you there? So the first thing that I'm going to take these all these questions to the item experts, and we are going to do a face validity analysis. Um, just a second. So going to the face validity, see, if you talk about the face validity, we are basically, this is the uh, a pool for how you conduct face validity. Let's come up here. So face validity final pool, if you see, this was the initial pool of questions that I had. So out of these questions, can you see this table? This table is talking about that we dropped about 20 questions. We added three more. And uh, this is again on the basis of the expert opinion that we did through the through our qualitative research of focus group interview. And then we reworded seven questions. So the reworded questions are given in blue. The uh, green questions are talking about the added questions. And we dropped about 20. So look at that. Out of 70, these questions are valid. And I'm talking about uh, me sitting down for every questionnaire. So despite the fact that you're sitting with experts when you're taking the questionnaire to the stakeholder, the stakeholder may view it differently. So it's very important to understand how the stakeholder is going to view it because ultimately we have to bring down the bias. We have to bring down the error. So the final poll, uh, this was the initial poll. These were a few questions of the university satisfaction. They said, um, you add on a, a generic question. I think my university is a good place to be. So we added this question. Now they said, we are going to be dropping this question. I am unable to handle my insecurities, getting a job, performing well as a student. Can anybody tell me why was this question dropped? Can anybody in the group tell me? Yes, are you there, everyone? Uh, please speak up. Unmute yourself and speak up. The more you speak, the better you will understand, please. Can anybody, can any of the teachers help me with this? Why was this question dropped? Yes, why was this question dropped? Are you there with me? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Actually, uh, 
मैम आई थिंक बिकॉज इनसिक्योरिटीज मे बी फ्रॉम अदर आस्पेक्ट ऑल्सो सो दैट माइट बी द रीजन इनसिक्योरिटीज आर फ्रॉम डिफरेंट एस्पेक्ट बट यू आर वेरी नियर विच इनसिक्योरिटी आर यू टॉकिंग अबाउट गेटिंग द जॉब परफॉर्मेंस और विच अदर फॉर एग्जाम्पल आई मे हैव एन इनसिक्योरिटी दैट आई वोट गेट अ जॉब बट आई एम वेरी गुड स्टूडेंट आई एम गेटिंग नाइनटी परसेंट बट आई स्टिल फील आई विल नॉट गेट अ जॉब बिकॉज आई एम नॉट स्मार्ट इनफ आई एम नॉट स्ट्रीट स्मार्ट सो देर और आई डोंट हैव एनी रेफरल so there is where uh, people will get confused this is a double barreled question you are actually having multiple answers to the same question so how will people mark how would you assess whether the insecurity was because of the not finding a job or because it was on performance or because of it was something else so we dropped this double barreled questions i don't feel the need to prove myself better than my peers at my university this question was also dropped this is because it's a competitive question and uh, uh iska answer bada hi uh, uh, you know pechida hai i don't feel the need to prove myself really are you talking about not need uh, you don't need the uh, there is no need to prove yourself so some people may put emphasis only to proving myself and some people may put emphasis to competition so again this question will bring out some data which will not lead us to what we are trying to measure so at the face validity level only we had to drop these questions and there were about 20 such questions uh, which we dropped uh, most of the times achieve the goal i set for myself uh, this was a question that was altered um, the actual question was i have a sense of directedness when it comes to my career now डायरेक्टेडनेस का क्या मतलब है डायरेक्टेडनेस का मीनिंग लोग अलग अलग समझते हैं सो यू मे बी फीलिंग दैट आई एम अ वेरी प्लान पर्सन आई एम अ वेरी ऑर्गेनाइज पर्सन आई एम कंसेंशियस इन नेचर बट डज दैट मीन दैट यू ऑल्सो अचीव यू मे बी सेटिंग अप गोल्स बट डू यू अचीव दैम सो वॉट इज मोर इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर अस इन दिस केस इज वेदर यू अचीव दैम और नॉट एंड नॉट वेदर यू पुट अप गोल्स और नॉट सो द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज टॉकिंग अबाउट पुटिंग अप गोल्स वेर एज the next question is talking about achievement so they said you need to alter this modify this question so that is the blue line these are few examples that i wanted to take with you uh, so this was another list of the final pool that we got so these were the changes that we brought about if you realize these were the questions that were dropped these three were added these three were these all were reworded and now comes the real challenge we have already undergone uh, face validity so i i was here we said uh, we are going to be starting with we started with focus group discussion for keywords then we did slr then we applied the tcm edo framework on the basis of tcm edo framework we got our research questions objectives and for our scale we got our dimensionality the dimensionality helped us to find out the different dimensions pertaining to this uh, uh, scale then we did fgd2 this was to select dimensions and once the dimensions were selected we went in for item generation item generation is a process whereby we created questions depending on the sub dimensions and the dimensions then we came up to fgd3 fgd3 was for item analysis through face validity so this was the first kind of validity check that we applied and uh, we had to drop certain items we had to reword certain items and then we had to uh, uh, go in for uh, changing or or adding certain items we are now to fgd4 now fgd4 is basically to do content analysis this is where we are doing uh, uh, we are checking on content validity and content validity is again a very important validity check which needs to be done through a statistical procedure and not just on the whims and fancies which is called as content validity index so now i'm going to be introducing to you a new term which is content validity index what is content validity index and how do we come to the content validity index so um, 
reaching out to another let me just open another paint uh, file so that i can explain it in greater detail to you so yeah just, just. yeah so we were here at content validity index now content validity is the initial stages what we did was we tried to analyze whether our uh, whether our topic whether our uh, questions that we formulated at the face of it were they okay or were they not so at the face of it if they were not okay we changed to reword reworded them and we came down to uh, certain questions that we needed to talk about so while making the questions please make a note of a few things one have a clear goal when you're talking about a clear goal means that um, what is the research question on your mind? So if you're trying to prepare a scale for SWB, then be very clear in terms of the dimensionality and the definitions and the sub-dimensions and their definitions. So you're talking about uh, sub-dimensions, their definitions, dimensions, their definitions, and on that basis, you're making questions. Um, please do not have any leading questions. Leading questions is, um, don't you feel faculty play an important role in uh, students' well-being, strongly disagree to strongly agree. So you've already said that uh, faculty play an important role. So why why give them the direction? No double-barreled questions. I already gave you an example of insecurities being double-barreled, where the answers could be one more than one. No prioritize. Do prioritize questions and limit the length of the questionnaire. Usually, you know, you should have the important questions in the beginning and then are followed by the lesser important question because. Fatigue is what sets in when people answer the questions and uh, that is where the problem starts. Don't use jargon. Please avoid all ma management jargon. Uh, most of us uh, are very, very keen on using this jargon. So just uh, keep it as simple as possible. Keep the target sample in mind by formulating the item. So, okay. When I'm talking about target sample in mind, then I'm talking about what my, my sample was students. But what kind of students? Go to your research design. You're talking about public, private, and deemed universities. You're talking about Delhi and CNCR. So you're talking about a student who's well-versed with the macroeconomic and other factors. You, you're talking about the uh, heart of the nation. You're talking about the capital city. And so there are certain presumptions that you would have about students of those kinds. So whenever you're formulating items, those presumptions have to be you know, uh, dealt with very, very clearly. And of course, I told you that whenever you're making your questionnaire, there are three questions, additional questions that you need to add on. One is that of a control variable that you would come from your that will come from your theory uh, or uh, the research papers that you have already read from, or you may decide on a control variable on the basis of the reading that you have done. The second is your marker variable, which is very very important for common method bias because a questionnaire has to has to be free from the bias, which we will do later when we are studying common method bias. I don't think I will be able to take up marker variable in these sessions, but yeah, uh, probably in some other time when we get to sit together again uh, on a workshop, we will be doing how to deal with control variables and how to deal with marker variables. Then um, uh, we talked about the global variable. So I really don't know whether my student well-being is going to come up as a formative scale or a uh, reflective scale. Remember, depending on the type of questions I asked, uh, it might just come up to be formative or it might be taken up as reflective. So uh, we uh, would always appreciate if you're having a questionnaire where you're using three scales, then uh, have a global item for every scale. Global item, what is a global item? It is just a clarity question, which is deriving the soul of the construct. So for happiness, are you happy? For well-being, I my life is fulfilling as a student. For work-life fulfillment, I think I lead a fulfilling life. So these are the basic questions, the, the generic question. If you were to talk about the entire construct in one line, that line would be your global question. So uh, then we did on to face validity. And now we have come up to, on the basis of face validity, we, we had 53 questions that were finalized. And now we will go up to content validity. So let's come up to our uh, real uh, real time work this is actual work that has been done by uh, one of my scholars and uh, this is uh, two of the papers of this has already been published in a category one is under review in one of the premier journals so yeah 
So now we have come up to CVI, Content Validity Index. Now, how do you come to CVI and what are we talking about? So first thing that you need to understand is in case of CVI, you need to have at least minimum of six to nine experts and not more than 10 experts. So you need to have experts of, uh, of the stature of here. I would want you to have RM experts more than any other experts. So uh, for content validity here, the nature of the experts is such that we should have RM experts. More of your people should be from the research methodology domain. You can have academic experts. They may also help you. And you may have at least the stakeholders. So you may have students who might just like to help you with the content validity. So these are the three categories that you would have for FGD4. And what does FGD4 do? Now, in FGD4, you give them a question. You put up all the questions on one side. And you say that you please rate every question. You tell every expert to rate every question on the basis of a scale. And what does the scale do? The scale says uh, for content validity. Just a second. So for content validity, we will try and get at least 10 experts, not more than 10 experts. What will the 10 experts do? You will give them a scale. They will rate each item on the basis of one, whether it is relevant or not relevant. So one is not relevant. Two, somewhat relevant. I will give it two marks if it is somewhat relevant. Three, quite relevant. I think it is a relevant question and I would give it three marks and four, highly relevant. Are you there with me? So on the basis of this rating scale, you will allow them or you will ensure that these people are putting up an answer or a set of answers for uh, your um, content validity. So they are going to be giving you answers which are going to look like this. So can you see this for every question? So this is question number one. We have about 53 questions. How did we come from 70 to 53 through face validity? And now uh, on these 53 questions, we are getting, we got the responses of all the rating, rating responses of all the 10 experts. And this was our, uh, Rating uh, calculator. This is where we are. Talking. Please mute yourself. Gitanjali. Dr. Rajiv, mute I'm here, ma'am. Yes, 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 ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Can I go ahead? Is there a confusion? Do we need to stop by any chance? Can yes, I continue? Can yes, I continue? Ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma it's okay. up to you. Either you will continue. No, no, no. Or I will I... continue. No, I thought okay. probably you. Uh, no, no, no. No problem. Was. Okay. Okay, so we had this one, two, three, four. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to. Uh, uh, Recode, recode the scale. So the rating scale has to be recoded. So the rating scale where people gave one and two, that is not relevant or someone relevant is given a zero. And the rating scale where they said it is quite relevant and highly relevant is given a one. Are we there? So people who were uh, talking about not relevant and somewhat relevant and quite relevant and high relevant, all the entire grid now changes, now changes a binary format of zero and one. Can you see this format here? Can any, everybody see this? Yes, so yes, yes ma'am, we can see. This is where we are talking about zero and one. 
ठीक है जी तो अब हमारे को क्या करना है नाउ आई हैव टू टॉक अबाउट सीवीआई वी हैव टू कैलकुलेट सीवीआई एंड व्हाट इज सीवीआई वी गोनो बी टॉकिंग अबाउट इट सो द फर्स्ट थिंग दैट देयर आर सर्टेन थिंग्स दैट वी नीड टू कैलकुलेट आफ्टर वी गॉट आवर रिस्पोंसेस एंड जीरोस एंड वन फर्स्ट एंड फॉरमोस्ट इज एक्सपर्ट्स इन अग्रीमेंट सो टोटल नंबर ऑफ एक्सपर्ट्स लेट्स टॉक अबाउट दिस कॉलम टोटल नंबर ऑफ एक्सपर्ट्स आर दोस एक्सपर्ट्स वेयर वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट Uh, the total number of experts in our case is 10 uh, in some other cases can be 9 8 depending on uh, how many you can get uh, not more than 10 but uh, it should be at least more than 6 experts experts in agreement experts in agreement refer to those questions which are having a 1 1 1 1 1 can you see this what can you see about such a question such a question is a very very important question because all experts are in agreement that is a good question so this particular question will find its way to my questionnaire my final questionnaire then we have something which is called as n minus a n minus a is giving you experts not in agreement this is number of experts minus experts in agreement also we are talking about how many questions did we have for experts in universal agreement universal agreement means that uh, how many questions are there where uh, all the experts were happy about the question so if you see question number 1 and 2 there will be a one in universal agreement for question number 3 since there were two zeros we did not give a one to universal agreement again we are moving binary zero or one so were they in universal agreement or were they not in universal agreement is all that we are trying to calculate here so uh, this is how you could get the rating of all the uh, possible uh, ideologies that you have set up and now we come to the real calculation of the content validity index now that you have rated the item and recoded them as 0 and 1 you also have recalibrated these items in terms of uh one you were talking about number of experts then you talked about number of experts in agreement then you talked about number of experts not in agreement you talked about number of experts in universal agreement so we have four letters number of experts experts in agreement not in agreement and universal agreement now what is cvi cvi is actually content validity index which was given by polit and beck polit and beck in 2006 did their work in cvi and they said the degree to which the instrument has appropriate number of items has appropriate items for the construct to be measured that means the degree to which my questionnaire has appropriate sample of items to be measured is is calibrated through cvi so cvi is actually having two types of calculations one is called as the scvi or the scale content validity index and the first is called as icvi this is item content validity index and this is scale content validity index so in case of the item content validity index we are talking about the individual item so it i is for in the individual item and how do you calculate icvi the formula to calculate icvi is a over n so what was a a was experts in agreement if you remember total number of experts in agreement over total number of experts are you there with me so when you talking about this particular uh, uh, formula we will calculate icvi by using this formula and coming up to a calculation of icvi for more than 6 to 9 expert icvi if we have 6 to 9 experts icvi value greater than 0.78 can be considered this is the citation is lin 1986 however if you have less than 6 experts then in their case you have to stick to icvi value equal to 1 that is you have to take at least all of them should be agreeing to it so this is polit and lin again 2007 so there are two depending on the number of experts 
this is uh, the acceptable ranges of icpi so icpi uh, usually i always suggest that you take 10 experts so 0.78 ke upar wala hamara sahi rehta hai and uh, when we were calculating icvi so somebody said that it is quite possible ki aapne badi chalaki ki hai aur aapne similar logo ko bula liya matlab uh, ek jaisa sochne walon ko bula liya or for that matter you have called friends together so it is quite the possibility that by chance they have given importance to a particular question because all of them think alike so while polit and beck were doing their work um somebody told them that icvi is not sufficient what you need to calculate along with icvi is um the chance control now the chance control or pc the probability that there has been no chance you know the, the chance of uh, people uh, marking out of similarity of thought process or because they like each other or because they are uh, wanting to be a part of the each other's uh, bandwagon um pc is calculated in terms of this formula so we have n factorial over a factorial into n minus a factorial do you understand what is factorial n factorial if n were 5 if n is equal to 5 then 5 factorial actually means 5 into 4 into 3 into 2 into 1 is that okay so 5 factorial will this, this there will be a value here and that will be the value of our 5 factorial so we have got probability of chance and probability of chance is now formulated through this particular formula so the second uh, thing that i have to note when i am talking about uh, item content validity index is pc we don't stop here because we need to create another index which is called as modified kappa modified kappa is the final index which will help us to identify whether a particular item should be taken or not taken to the final questionnaire so when you talking about modified kappa modified kappa is represented by k star which is equal to i c v i minus p c over 1 minus p c now the criteria the criteria of selection of modified kappa is always k star should be greater than 0.75 if such a case is there we say our item is an excellent item so here we are talking about the third category of calculation that you need to do for for calculation of icbr so when you're talking about the item content validity index there are three things that we need to do icbr a over n to pc n factorial over a factorial over n minus a factorial then we have modified kappa which is icvi minus pc over 1 minus pc k star value should be greater than 0.75 for an item should be excellent if you have 6 to 9 experts or 10 experts icvi greater than point greater than equal to 0.7 uh 5 is uh, good 0.78 is good enough and uh, in case you have less than 6 experts then you have to go for icvi equal to 1 are we there so now let's get back to the real working so what we did was we we calculated icvi if you see this you can see the formula here uh we calculated pc which was factorial and then we applied all these powers then there was verified kappa again through the values and we got these values here now the most important for us is here this is modified kappa on the basis of modified kappa we said uh, greater than 0.75 is going to be excellent so can you see these pink 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 items uh, and this is the modified kappa range so minus 1 if uh, modified kappa range minus 1 to 0 remove the item 0 to 0.4 it's a poor item a uh, 0.4 to 0.59 minus 0.5 uh, positive 0.59 is fair 0.6 to 0.74 it's a good item we may like to keep it 0.75 and above equal to 0.75 and above is an excellent item so once you have this ranges you have calculated all the uh, you have identified whether a particular item was uh, excellent fair good poor and now we come to the calculation of 
SCVI. What is SCVI? Scale Content Validity Index. So what is Scale Content Validity Index and what is the formula? So uh, SCVI is now actually uh, calculated on different fundamental. And I will tell you how we calculate SCVI. So for content validity, we said we are going to be uh, calculating two things. Uh, one is ICVI. We said ICVI is, uh, uh, we need to also calculate PC. And third, the most important is modified kappa. So modified kappa is going to give me my range of excellent and fair and good items. So uh, beyond this, once we have modified kappa calculations, now I have to move to SCVI. SCVI is scale validity index and it is actually calculated through three ways. First is called as SCVI universal agreement. SCVI universal agreement, which is basically sum of all universal agreements, that is U over total number of agreements. Now, usually the uh, SCVI value goes low as the number of experts go high because universal agreement logon ka hoye ga hi So, bada mushkil ho jata hai is value uh, ko attain karna. So, SCVI value can be, con uh, can be calculated on the basis of universal agreement and another basis of calculating SCVI value may be average. So, on the basis of average, SCVI is calculated by dividing sum of all ICVIs over total number of items. Okay. Now, this is where uh, this, this particular methodology is very preferred because it is less stringent. And the criteria, the criteria to retain SCVI is SCVI should be always greater than equal to 0.9. So, it is not 90% of the items scale catch on our scale. Hai. So, that is where we are talking about uh, reaching out to universal agreement with the number of experts that we suggest is absolutely practically not possible. So, even Paulette and Beck suggest that the second method, the averages method, is the best method. Another method that you have, again, which is not very preferred, this has been given by uh, the, you know, the the makers, the Pollitt and Beck, the basic authors, the seminal authors themselves have said that you can avoid this method because it is not practically possible to calculate it. So this is basically, it says sigma i 1 to 10. We are talking about some of relevant ratings of all items, some of relevant ratings and over total number of items and dividing this entire thing by total number of experts. So this is, again, the most toughest to calculate. This is based on proportion. And uh, here we are uh, not uh, actually even going through this particular kind of proportion because it becomes very, very difficult to calculate uh, SCVI uh, by this particular nature. So three scales that you should be very, very, uh, three uh, things that you should be very, very clear of, that when we are doing content validity, the first thing that, Ma'am, you are not audible. I am not audible? Yes, yes. Now it is all right now. Okay. So, uh, three things, uh, four things that we need to do uh, content validity. Uh, when we are doing content validity, we need to make sure of. First is calculation of ICVI. Second is calculation of uh, probability control. Uh, chance control uh, and third is modified kappa. Fourth is SCVI calculation through ABE. So, now you can see. जब हमने SCVI calculation की through AVE, this is what we got. Can I, I will just highlight the table so that you understand what we are talking about. So in this table, when I did a SCVI calculation through all ICVIs, all ICVIs. So what I did was all the 53 ICVIs sum divided by the number of items. So the uh, ICVI that we got was only 0.81. Then we did through matrix, it was again 0.81. So uh, we were really, really, really concerned as to how will we calculate our uh, SCVI. 
and uh, what we did was we calculated all those SCVIs that should have only excellent values. And when I did only excellent values, we got items uh, which where the SCVI value went over 0.9. So usually kya karna hai, hume ICVI ka sum wahan lena hai jahan pe excellent values hai. Agar aapka uh, all ICVI pe aja hai, well and fine, usually nahi aata hai, mere case mein nahi aaya tha. So what I did was, I picked up ICVI of only excellent items, divided it by the total number of items and I got my 0.9, which was my, uh, uh, which was the, the uh, CVI that I was expecting at. So yeah. We are talking about ICVI through the matrix, and this is where we have now come to. This was a calculation that I was showing last time. So, yes. Can you see this? I have to taken up only SCVI for excellent items. These are all the excellent items put together. And excellent items, when I calculated the ICVI average through ICV, I got 0.92. So, can you see this 0.92 value? And uh, can you see the 0.57 value uh, of universal agreement? So just as the uh, authors themselves say, call it back themselves say that uh, there's no point going for universal agreement value technique. It is okay if you go in for um, a, a technique which is as robust and as uh, perfect as it can be, which is SCBI calculation through averages. And the averages are you use the ICBI values and you divide it by the total number of items to get your total uh, proportion of items. So if you realize now we are left with 35 items. Can you see this? So only 35 items were uh, excellent and we got an ICVI of these uh, total number of items where uh, my ICVI through averages was uh, 0.9286. So I think uh, we stop here before I go in for scale refinement. That should be at uh, after this particular break. So you take a break, it's been too heavy. If there is a question, I can definitely help you with the questions and uh, then you can go ahead. So this is face validity. We did content validity. Uh, we talked about ICVI, SCVI, universal agreement and acceptance. These are the questions. You can ask me questions before we move up to EFA or scale refinement. Yes, any questions guys? Dr. Arti Vyas, are you moderating it or uh, Dr. Rajiv is moderating? No, ma'am, actually Dr. Sunita Punya is moderating. Okay, okay so Sunita ji, can we break uh, for uh, uh, a short break and we can come back at 12 and then we can go in for the second session? Yes, yes, ma'am, sure, sure. You can have a break and we will be there after. Back by 12. Right. Sure. So we will have sure. second session 12 to 1 30 and then we can break for lunch and 2 to 3 30 should be the final session. Sure, ma'am. Sure. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Any queries if you have, you can just put it on the chat box if you don't want to ask. Sure. So participants can rejoin after a break. Please share the PPT. <laughs> this is a uh, <laughs> This is a trainer's PPT. Uh, yes. So we can go to. I will share this as a bit. Sure, ma'am. Any other question from participants? I don't know how you are uh, not having questions. Uh, people who are making it, uh, they are having so many questions usually. <laughs> Is everybody getting how I'm teaching and what I'm teaching? Yes, sir. Y yes, ma'am. Yes, you are explaining in a very good way. And each and everything is very clear. So I think the participants are also happy with this session. So that's why some uh, many of them are uh, putting a message that very nice session. Chale, uh, if in case you have a query later, you can still contact me and we can work on it. So let's take a break. Okay, ma'am.
So good afternoon, everyone. We are starting the session again. Um, do we have to wait two more minutes for all others to join or we can start? Uh, Ma'am, participants are there all, so I think we can start. It's on you, Ma'am. Okay, give me a minute. I'll start. Sure, sure. Welcome back. Uh, we are now on our fourth stage of skill development, that is module four where we are going to be talking about scale purification. So what is scale purification? In this, we are going to be talking about pilot testing through exploratory factor analysis, and I will be showing you uh, your hands-on through SPSS. So going back to uh, what we did last time, we were basically talking about face validity and content validity. We uh, went in through different uh, dimensional uh, requirements and item analysis. So what we did was from literature review, we moved up to from literature review, we moved up to uh, dimensionality of the table. We talked about dimensional table elaborated, then we talked about dimensional table brief. We took this table to focus groups and we formulated our first set of items. Uh, once we did our item analysis through face validity, so the template was this, we had a final pool from face validity. And uh, this final pool was uh, actually vetted by uh, FGD, that is focus group discussions through experts. So we had a few questions dropped, few taken up, and now few reworded. Once we were okay with the kind of questions and the questionnaires we got, we went in for uh, here at this stage, we had about 53 questions. We took it to the CVI calculator. We uh, calculated ICVI and SCVI uh, through a series of two kind of focus group interviews uh, of about maximum 10 experts. We calculated ICVI, TC, and modified CARPA. We calculated SCVI through averages. And then we came down to our final set of items for data collection. So these were the 35 set of items that we had for data collection. The same situation, uh, we have to follow whatever be the construct that is under consideration. So uh, for any kind of construct, uh, we will be uh, following the same process. And then we come up to what is called as uh, exploratory factor analysis. So this was content validity. Now we come to exploratory factor analysis. Um, I told you that uh, whenever we are constructing the scheme, only in case of whenever we are making a new scheme, you would want to do or you would have to do exploratory factor analysis. 
So when I'm talking about exploratory fact analysis, uh, the word itself says that it has to explore new factors. That means, uh, but what are these factors? Uh, we already had dimensions, right? But these were the dimensions which were not empirically tested and were mentioned in literature theoretically. So uh, these dimensions which were mentioned on the literature theoretically had to be uh, checked again, tested again, and the scale needs to be purified. So when I talk about uh, purification of scale, I want to take it to a segment of the real respondent, real shop floor I would want to take it to and analyze that how is the respondent reading my question? How is the respondent actually trying to identify which, uh, with say my, uh, a construct at hand. Suppose I'm working on positive leadership. I want to find out uh, what is positive leadership and what are the factors of positive leadership. So uh, on that basis, what I do is I try to uh, make certain questions follow the same route as we had done in um, calculation of face and content validity. And now we now need to check whether the real respondent is okay with me uh, understanding my question and can uh, take some relevant cues out of it. So we come to what is called as pilot testing. We are at uh, step two. Now we start with the, a new set of data collection. So we had already conducted four focus groups. It's a mixed method for uh, skill development. We said we'd already conducted four focus groups. We are at stage this of scale purification. So uh, when you were talking about uh, exploratory fact analysis, what is it? It is described as an orderly simplification of interrelated measures. So initially proposed by Charles Spearman in 1904, it is used to explore. I, uh, the word here is explore. So definitely your research design is exploratory and cross-sectional. Why? Because you are making a scale and hence you will be exploring the possible underlying factor structure of the of the construct at hand. So we started with leadership as a concept. We came down to uh, positive leadership and we did all that we needed to do for coming up to uh, a level where we could collect our data through pilot test. So uh, what we were trying to do here in this case is come up to this level uh, for uh, say positive leadership. If positive leadership was my construct if under consideration, then uh, uh, we started with uh, this being the construct and it derives itself from the, from the concept of leadership. So the bigger umbrella is leadership from different types of leadership, from where the different types of leadership emanate. And from the uh, concept of leadership, we came down to positive leadership. Now, this was the construct, which was, again, it went through all the uh, seven procedures of content validity. And we had a list of few questions that were available, which now had to be, had now to be checked for purification. Now, after item analysis and item generation, this was item analysis. We are now coming on scale purification. Scale purification, the mandatory technique is EFA. And it is an exploratory technique that is for the first time, for the first time, will you be able to identify with what is the factorization uh, nature of the construct that is positive leadership at hand. So what we did was we went up to uh, identify how many people would we want for this study, isn't it? So typically, uh, you will apply exploratory fact analysis when there is no prior hypothesis. Why? Uh, what is an hypothesis? It is an assumption based out of uh, some uh, literature that is already available. But I am going to be exploring my factors for the first time. So uh, should I have a hypothesis for EFA? No, there's going to be no hypothesis for EFA because it's an explanatory. Uh, it has an explanatory nature. Now, the dimensionality, uh, please, uh, Dr. Sunita, in co mute Kadija, who think, uh, that this is my. Dr. Sunita, can you hear me? Yes, 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 y
डायमेंशनैलिटी ऑफ द कॉन्स्ट्रक्ट इफ इज यूज वेन द रिसर्चर वॉन्ट्स टू डिस्कवर सो वी आर द की वर्ड हियर इज डिस्कवर we want to discover the number of factors influencing variables and to analyze which variables go together so um, a basic hypothesis is that there are m common latent factors and uh, uh are to be discovered in the data set and the goal is to find out the smallest number why because we are talking about parsimonious nature of the construct we want minimum factors and we want minimum questions so that our questionnaire is robust enough with the least possible we should be able to get the maximum output so we will always be applying efa when we are exploring something new to simplify a set of data the ideology the objective behind is to simplify the data you want to reduce the number of measures so the first reduction will happen at the phase validity stage the second reduction happen at the content validity stage now this is the third reduction technique which is more statistical in orientation and now this is the first quantitative reduction technique uh, uh through all these we were going through qualitative techniques now we are now introducing a uh, new quantitative techniques ma'am can you please mute dr sunita can you meet mute uh, this uh, participant please kindly mute uh, this participant dr sunita are you there okay so when we are talking about uh, the data structure to identify the underlying structure of the data in which a large number of variables measure a small basic characteristic so basically you are trying to find out what all variables are going to depict the similar characteristics or putting it simply you want to obtain independent factors now the key word here is independent क्या मतलब है देर एग्जिस्ट नो को रिलेशन बिटवीन द फैक्टर्स ये अलग अलग बातों से निकला है बट हाँ ये डेटा रिडक्शन टेक्निक है अगेन वी आर ट्राइंग टू यू नो यूज द डेटा टू द मिनिमल पॉसिबल रेंज so for this there are certain assumptions one you need metric data uh, i hope you all understand what is metric data so when we are talking about metric data we are talking about data which is uh, uh, numeric and uh, it it may be on interval we are talking about uh, no outliers outliers are the uh, people who are not falling under the range of the frequency distribution of uh, otherwise uh, normally distributed population or even if not normally distributed population they are absolutely not answering hay wire that means they are not answering to an extremity level so we reduce those or we uh, remove those uh, people who are answering on a very extreme level so that they do not affect our data also uh, you need to check for no missing values when i talk about no missing values we are talking about a sample where uh, none of the options goes blank so uh, we want every every uh, cell in the excel sheet on the excel sheet to be full and for uh, the, for running in efa we do it through spss so i will be showing you uh, the real practical example through spss but uh, the the reality is that when you are running through spss uh, the excel sheet has to be converted to into an sav file that means you have to create a file in spss which is having two types of views so uh, how many people should be contact to get the data filled from so one uh, you you should have as heterogeneous a sample as possible because more the sample homogeneous uh, lesser will be the variance introduced by the factor rules so a uh, sample to variable ratio should be ns to p that is 3 is to 1 that means um, if uh, you have 10 questions then you should have at least 30 respondents who are uh, answering those 10 questions so 1 is to 30 ka ratio hona 1 is to uh, number of questions ka ratio hona chahiye so that would be deriving your uh, uh, sample 1 is to 3 ke ratio pe we will be deriving our samples the kmo there are thought uh, certain checks the kmo bartlett sphericity uh, test of sampling adequacy should be uh, greater than 0.6 this test basically is trying to understand ki jitne aapne log liye hain for sample uh, for running an efa wo sufficient hai ya nahi hai 
So KMO test uh, is uh, talking about uh, uh, that, yes, we have taken an adequate sample for this particular study. And we already discussed the thumb rule that uh, it has to be 1s to n, n is to p, where n is the sample and p is the parameter, or p is the number of items. So number of items, if there are th 53, then we go to uh, uh, 3 times 53, at least 150 mm, questions or uh, 150 people have to be, or respondents have to be approached for getting your questionnaire filled in the initial stages. So uh, uh, there is also an assumption that all these items are correlated. Now, items are correlated, not factors. There are two things that we are talking about, items and factors. Now, I will give you an example of this example, which is very near uh, to your uh, real life. And uh, I would try to draw an analogy and help you to make you understand through that analogy. So, uh, you know, first and foremost, let me just uh, explain to you a situation wherein, uh, suppose your university wants to conduct a research conference, okay? Now, when you have to conduct a research conference, the VC, the Honorable Vice Chancellor, addresses all the members or the, all the faculty of the university, and he says that all of you have to participate. There are two assumptions. One is, Everybody participates. So we will be making different teams and we will be making as many teams as there are faculty. So we will be making too many teams and we will be now uh, telling every faculty be, to be a part of all committees. So in order to conduct the research conference, we would conduct, uh, we would have a publication committee, we would have a finance committee, we would have an admissions committee, we would have a uh, research committee, we would have a hospitality committee, we would have a um, you know, uh, a pool patta kind of a committee, the the gardening committee, which is going to take care of how the university is going to look on the day or the finale. We would also have a committee which will take into consideration security. We will also have a committee which will take into consideration. Ab IP mein bahut sare stray dogs aa jaate hain, to unko hatane ke liye bhi ek committee. So bahut sare committees aapne bana di. Aur rule kya tha? Ki all of us are going to be, every individual member is going to be a part of all the committees. Now, I as a member of IP University is a member of all the committees that the VC Vice Chancellor has just made. But what is happening is I, by virtue of my choice and skill, would like to be more or contributing more to the, uh, to the research committee or probably to the um, uh, these uh, publication committees. So I, I chose to put in more effort. I was more related. I felt more related. I had a, a clear bearing with the research and the publication committee. So I started working very hard for the research and publication committee. I had to go for meetings for even the committee which was handling stray dogs. But yeah, I was not really interested in that committee. And sometimes I used I would go and sometimes I would not go. So uh, there were other members of the university who did not want to do the work and who wanted to shirk work. So what they did was, let's be a member of all the committees, but we will handle, uh, we will not handle anything. We will not be contributing anything to any committee. But yeah, we will be a titulary member. You understand what is a titulary member? But so there would be quite a few members who will not be even contributing to 50% to any of the committees. Fair enough. Now, after about uh, two, three months, the Honorable Vice Chancellor thinks that now let me take a brief of uh, who all, uh, what all work has been done as far as this research conference is concerned. So uh, he decides to call a meeting. Now, in this meeting, will all the 250 faculty go or only few faculty will go? Only those faculty will go who are uh, really handling, who are the heart and soul of a particular committee and can represent all others. Everybody is a part of that committee, but they can represent a little more than the rest of the group. So for research and publication, they called me. For uh, hospitality, there was another faculty. For, uh, uh, for a group of faculty, for other uh, committees, there were another group of faculties. And the VC will now take a meeting wherein a better group also, will he take a meeting of the um, straight-off committee? Of course not. That will be manageable, isn't it? 
so he will take the meeting of only the important committees which is being represented by only the important people or the people who are contributing greater than 70% of their times to these particular committees of course they have to be a part of all the committees so now these people can we say can represent the success of the conference can contribute a variance to the success of the conference uh, and if, if, we, if I were to measure the success of the conference through these committees, can I be able to classify different committees which are the most important committees also so such that the people working, the IP University people working in those committees can be highlighted and the important ones can be talked about. So ultimately, what is happening? We are going to the same people who actually contributed. And if you understand it from the attention, conference In other words, अगर 60% success rate in सब से आ जाएगा, या ये सब 60% success rate अगर हम मान के चलें, तो हम इन लोगों से, इन 10, 15, 20 लोगों के basis पर कर सकते हैं, तो क्या better नहीं है? It is better than to have a meeting of all the 250 put together. So just as you would work on this particular phenomena, items that we took for our scale also works on the same phenomena. Now, what happens is the items are going to be now. I'm going to run the uh, uh, EFA and we are going to be explaining it to you through this, uh, uh, through the analogy I have just drawn. Okay. So, the first thing, the first assumption is, wo sare log IP university ke hone Kya matlab hai? all these items or all these um, people or faculty should be related, related in terms of their working profile in IP university. So if I have somebody from outside IP, will he be included for the conference? No. So the first assumption is that I need to have a matrix. I need to have items which are correlated, isn't it? So the null hypothesis is that the items are not correlated and I'm going to be rejecting this null hypothesis through Bartlett test of sphericity. It is as simple as only IP university people will be taken up for the uh, for the job and nobody apart from IP university should be involved. So if we presume that the null hypothesis is none of the IP people to be taken, we reject the null hypothesis and that is through the Bartlett test of sphericity. So two assumptions, one, KMO, KMO that is uh, sampling adequacy, that the number of people that have to be selected for the sample are fine and uh, KMO value should be greater than 0.06. And uh, there should be a correlation between different items. Some ka sare log IP ki hone chahiye. So correlation between different items. And that you have to verify through the Bartlett, Bartlett test of sphericity. So let me take you to the hands-on uh, example where we are uh, going to SPSS. So the SPSS uh, sheet looks uh, similar to what is there on the screen. Is my screen visible? Is my screen visible? So, yeah, uh, I had uh, a combination of uh, when you open the SPSS file, there are two options. The first option is uh, that of data view and the second option is that of variable. When I talk about the variable view, uh, variable names have been coded for positive leadership. We had about uh, uh, many items, about 29 items for positive leadership. So we coded them as PL1, PL2, PL3. The type of uh, the item is definitely numeric. There are different aspects that you can have here. For example, if you check this, you see that it can be numeric, comma, dot, scientific notation, date, dollar, string, any of these options you can give. So here only I had given the width to be eight. That means for eight decimals uh, and two decimals, eight width and two decimal places, I have decided on to keep my, um, how to record my, value for a particular item the labeling tells me what the item actually means for example see uh, pl1 is my leader praises my leader praises faculty members for their job performance so uh, what are we going to talk about here um, um, for the first item we are talking about positive leadership this was my first item my leader often compliments me for good work this was my second item and the explanation of these items have been given in the labeling section. Also, what was the scales used? So, scale ke liye hum yaha pe values de dete hain. 
so i have given a, a value to this particular uh, ideology if you see for this particular question that is question number 1 my leader praises faculty members for their job performance the value uh, will vary from 1 to 7 so it's a 1 to 7 ka likert scale where one is strongly disagree and seven is strongly agree so uh, similarly i have put up likert scale for almost all 29 items and uh, i have ensured that there is no missing item there is none columns are eight since we are dealing with it and here we are aligning them to the right so that it is comfortable and if you see they are all metric variables and uh, they are all scale variables so if you realize there are three options here again nominal ordinal and scale when you talking about uh, these likert items which are on a 1 to 7 scale which is a summative likert scale we put scale here right so this is how the variable view looks like this is uh, what the variable view has to be drawn this has to be put up on the basis of your questionnaire so uh, we have 29 items and after after content validity index for positive leadership and then we went into data now look at the data view so this is the data that was achieved so for pl1 to pl29 uh this is how it's going to move see still till pl29 we had all the questions here and uh, all the responses here there was no response there were 97 uh, items that we started with so we went up to analyze how do you run efa i'm going to run efa and then i'm going to explain it again dimension reduction factor so you go to analyze on the menu you run dimension reduction and you go to factor when you go to factor what you going to do is you going to select all these variables and take them here now you also need to identify that what what were the two uh, uh, very important uh, things that we wanted to know there are two assumptions one assumption is that uh the sampling adequacy has to be maintained and second is that there is a uh, there is a, 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 the uh, there is correlation between the items to humne ye maan liya ki nahi hai correlation nahi hai hypothesis ye banai aur usko check karne ke liye humne bartlett test of sphericity lagaya so i'm just ticking this particular uh box now coming up to extraction there are different uh, variables um, that you have now there are different ways in which you can conduct efa so these are different algorithms that are available so uh, when you are talking about absolutely uncorrelated uh, factors when the factors are absolutely uncorrelated then you go for principal component analysis but there are uh, areas like psychology where the factors are related for example success of marriage is dependent on uh, success of marriage may have trust and love as a variable now trust and love as a factor are very uh, highly correlated so in that case you would go in for principal access factory where you want related variables related factors but since i am working in the area of social sciences where i do not want factors to be Uh, related to each other, or the, the, I want the factors to be independent, so I would pick up on principal component. So eigenvalues, uh, the thumb rule for eigenvalue is we are going to take eigenvalue greater than one and putting greater numbers for convergence so that it becomes easier. Convergence is nothing, but it is going to recreate. It is um, EFA's algorithm is based out of residual regression. so it continues to take its value in an iterative process till it comes to the final factor loading and the factorization schedule that is available to you we don't need to know about it much but what we need to know is that how it is happening and why is it happening and why it is an iterative process now since it is an iterative process we also need to rotate the data so that is where we are going to go in for the third segment that is available to us for uh, so there is direct abdominal rotation at equimax quatimax varimax is the rotation that helps us to come up to a level where we are uh, comfortable enough for social sciences so varimax rotation again i'll increase the iteration so that the data converges you can keep it the same also uh, if i want to save the factor scores then you can save as variables and the best is anderson rubin uh, if you want to say the variable score now this is nothing but the latent variable score remember we said that um, whenever we are going to conduct 
uh, we are we want to have a value of the factor from the items so we need to store the value of the factor in the item through the latent variables course so you could get one variable score here through SPSS, you can uh, save it through either of the methods, regression, Bartlett, or Anderson Rubin. You, Anderson Rubin is supposedly the best, but I don't need the LSV scores here. So I will skip this. Coming up to options, I will sort it by size and I will suppress all which are less than, uh, say, 0.4 or let me put 0.45. So let me just check how it goes. Or let me put five see how it goes. This is okay and let me run it. So the first table that we should know is the KMO Bartlett table where we are talking about the sampling adequacy. The Kaiser Meyer and Auckland measure of sampling adequacy is 0.899. So if you realize the what has been the uh, uh, thumb rule for sampling adequacy, the number of respondents, the rule of the thumb, this was for number of respondents. We we would come up to, yeah, let me come up to sampling adequacy. Yeah. So the KMO measure of sampling adequacy determines the appropriateness of the sample size above 0 0.90. If the KMO value is there, it is marvelous. 0 0.80 to 0 0.89, it is meritorious. 0 0.70 to 79, it is middling. 0 0.60 to 69, it is mediocre. And below 0 0.60, we should not actually accept it. Uh, we should increase the number of uh, people responding to the survey so that we get our sampling adequacy here. So if you realize, this is 0 0.899, which is very good for me. Uh, it is uh, just at the excellent stage. And Bartlett test of sphericity. Bartlett test of sphericity is checking whether the items that I have made for positive leadership are interrelated or not, are having some correlation or not. So uh, we are going to uh, talk about uh, uh, the Bartlett test of sphericity. What was the null hypothesis? We believe that there is no correlation and we want to reject the null hypothesis. Why? Because ultimately we want correlation. So significance is 0 0.00. We reject the null hypothesis. That means the Bartlett test of sphericity has rejected our null hypothesis, which was that there is no correlation between different items. So hum kya karenge ab? Hum bilkul safe hai. Both our checkpoints are clear. And now we go to uh, the second stage. If all these items were representing uh, individual faculty members of the uh, um, the analogy I drew from IP University of conducting a work, uh, uh, the conference, you would see that these faculty or these factors are contributing to greater than 0.70%. Are you there? Can you see it? Hum wo wale faculty ko VC sir ke paas nahi le jayenge, jo 50% से कम या 50% के अराउंड ही काम कर रहा है हम ऐसे इंसान को नहीं ले जाएंगे क्योंकि उसको काम पता ही नहीं है कि वो क्या रहा है सो व्हाट वी आर गोइंग टू डू इज वी गोइंग टू चेक द कम्युनलिटीज कम्युनलिटीज इज बेसिकली हाउ ऑल द फैक्टर्स पुट टुगेदर एक्सप्लेन द वेरिएंस इन अ पर्टिकुलर आइटम सो ऑल द वर्क पुट टुगेदर ऑल द वर्क पुट टुगेदर माय सिंगल इंडिविजुअल फैकल्टी दिस वन एम uh, M29 uh, uh, is contributing to 55% only. So only 55% variance is coming down to all the work he has done in all the committees. That means he's not good enough. And what are the checkpoints that we need to check? The cumulative variance, cumulative variance is 75%. We are taking only those factors which eigenvalue greater than one. What is eigenvalue? Eigenvalue is how a particular factor is explaining all the items put together. So, you can see the most important or robust factor in which many people contribute to the most. This is a thumb rule that the basic, the first factor is that many people do it. So, for a research conference, for research uh, publications, the uh, most important factor is so, you can see the percentage variance is the most important factor. So, we are taking eigenvalue greater than 1. This is 75.41 cumulative percentage. Now, the success of the conference, 75% is getting explained by all these people putting their work together. So, uh, what do I do? I don't like Mr. 29 because all the factors put together are able to explain only 55% variance in this man in terms of the work he is contributing. 
So what I do is I go back uh, to analyze and I go back again to C to dimension reduction, go to my factor reduction and check. कि अगर मैं मिस्टर ट्वेंटी नाइन को हटा दूंगी तो क्या मेरी वेरियंस बढ़ती है कि नहीं बढ़ती है सर सेंड हिम बैक होम दैट नहीं आप नहीं जा सकते बीसी सर के पास हम तो आप इस लाइक नहीं है अभी क्योंकि आपने सारी कमेटियों का काम हम अगर हम गिन ले तो आपके अंदर खाली पचपन प्रतिशत वेरियंस आ रही है तो विच इज नॉट गुड इनफ सो वी विल से ओके एंड लेट्स चेक अगेन की एम ओ वैल्यू इज फाइन बाटलेट इज फाइन Communalities are all sorted, and oh my God, it got reduced seventy-two percent. But the number of factors also got reduced. The number of factors has also gone down in terms of that particular variance. अब उसको हटाने की बजाय ये तो मैंने देखा ही नहीं कि Mr. Fifty-six was at point three four eight. तो ये तो गड़बड़ हो गई. इसीलिए seventy-two percent रह गया हमारा cumulative percentage. कोई बात नहीं. हम उन्हें वापस बुला लेते हैं उन्होंने कहा कि आपने देखा ही नहीं जी एक और आदमी है जो बिल्कुल ही काम नहीं कर रहा आपने मुझे हटा दिया और उसको रहने दिया तो वेर इज मिस्टर वॉट वॉज द नंबर कैन यू रिमेम्बर वॉट वॉज द नंबर फिफ्टी सिक्स फिफ्टी सिक्स मिस्टर फिफ्टी सिक्स हैज टू बी रिमूव एंड सी लेट सी सो यस माई केमो वैल्यू हैज गॉन अप You see this communal, uh, the communality, uh, the Bartlett test of sphericity is significant. Communalities. This should be all greater than 0.5. So it is now looking greater than 0.5, which is good enough. And see, my number has increased from 72% to 73.9. Now, cumulative variance of 73.9 appears to be really cool. And uh, I need to now check how are the factors extracted. So we can skip on the next, which is the component matrix. What is important for us is the rotated component matrix. So in the rotated component matrix, I saw that see, this is the contribution. This particular uh, factor or this particular uh, committee, these five faculty were really putting their heart and soul to it. And alone from this particular one community committee. पीएल फोर्टीन का एट्टी थ्री परसेंट काम हम बता सकते हैं कि वो इस कम्युनिटी से ही एक्सप्लेन हो गया है जो उन्होंने टोटल काम किया उसमें से एट्टी थ्री परसेंट इसी वाली कमिटी से एक्सप्लेन हो गया है जिसकी वजह से अगर हमें अगर फर्स्ट कमिटी की रिप्रेजेंटेशन में किसी को ले जाना है टू मीट द ऑनरेबल वाइस चांसलर देन इट शुड बी मिस्टर पी एल फोर्टीन सो आई सी दैट ऑल दीज आर लोडिंग दीज आर कॉल्ड एज फैक्टर लोडिंग वॉट इज द फैक्टर लोडिंग मीन it is the correlation between this that is the item and the factor the item and the factor mera relationship with research and publication so mera relationship with research and publication is 0.83 which is very high so i should be taken whenever the research and publication committee is going to the honorable vice chancellor i should be taken why because there is a high correlation so factor loadings are giving you nothing but a high correlation अगर हम इसका स्क्वायर कर देंगे तो हमारे को परसेंटेज वेरिएंस आ जाएगा इन टर्म्स ऑफ वन तो सिक्सटी फोर परसेंट इसी से आ रहा है क्योंकि पॉइंट एट है तो एट एट जो सिक्सटी फोर सिक्सटी फोर परसेंट एक ही फैक्टर से मेरा सारा काम एक्सप्लेन हो रहा है इसलिए पॉइंट एट थ्री सिक्स है मैं तो पक्का जा रही हूँ फर्स्ट वाली कमेटी में बट ये देखिए ये जो है मिस्टर पी एल ये कहीं पे भी लोड नहीं करे एक्चुअली ऐसा नहीं है कि ये कहीं पे भी लोड नहीं कर रहे या इनका रिलेशन कम है मगर इनका रिलेशन फिफ्टी से कम था यू रिमेम्बर अगर मैं इसको हमने यहाँ पे सप्रेस करा था ऑप्शंस में जाकर हमने बिलो पॉइंट फाइव मतलब जिनका पॉइंट फाइव जीरो से कम रिलेशनशिप है उनको मत लीजिए अगर मैं इसको पॉइंट फोर जीरो कर देती हूँ तो देखिए क्या होता है लेट्स सी हाउ द गेम चेंजेस सो द गेम हैज चेंज्ड विल चेंज हियर इन द रोटेटेड कॉम्पोनेट मैट्रिक्स एंड सी दिस कैन यू सी दिस Now what has happened is uh, Mr. PLM fifteen is is having a low correlation point four point four and point four. ये तीन कमेटियों में काम कर रहे हैं और point four point four correlation है. The fact that he is contributing to all these actually what did I tell you that each member should contribute to every committee. So every item is loading on to every factor, but we will consider to be a part of. Highly core uh, related to a particular factor, depending on where it is loading the highest. So we see 
that uh, uh, here, if I talk about uh, PL14, if, even if I was to suppress less than 0.4, he is only loading on factor 1. Not that he is not loading on 2, 3, 4, 5. But the loading on 2, 3, 4, 5 or the relationship with committee 2, committee 3, committee 4 and committee 5 is very, very minimal. So if I have to consider him, I will only consider him in factor 1. If I have to consider this item, I will only consider him in factor 1. What about this case, PL8, where the loading is, the correlation is 0.6, which is quite high for factor 1 and 0 0.42, which is also reasonably moderate uh, for factor 2. So now there are three cases uh, that you may, uh, you may, um, you know, think about. Uh, similarly, uh, there are many other uh, factors that need to be talked about. PL1. PL1 may 0.5 bar is the correlation with factor 2. Now, in this case, when the loading is very fast, in the sense that in the correlation with committee 2 and committee 3, both are very fast. So if there is XYZ who is very related to the uh, admissions, uh, uh, hospitality also it is very related to the uh, uh, accommodation, of, uh, hospitality and accommodation. So it's not only the Khana Pina committee, but also the accommodation committee. So here I can actually, actually take him either in both the committees. That means this item can be put up to any of both the committees or I can take up, take him up with the committee where the factor loading is high. So either I take them up where the factor loading is high or I take him up where the factor loading is uh, in both the committees. Or if the factor loading is very low and very minimal in all the committees, then I can even reject this item. Yeah, this confusing item. This is confusing item. This is a people pleaser. Hota hai. वो कहता है मैं तो सब जगह काम करके दिखाऊंगा जी मैं तो सारी कमेटियों में आ, अपनी कोरिलेशन मेरी तो हाई है तो मैं पॉइंट सेवन इधर भी हूँ पॉइंट सिक्स इधर भी हूँ पॉइंट फोर उधर भी हूँ पॉइंट फाइव उधर भी हूँ तो ऐसा जो मेंबर है अगर आप उसे लेके जाओगे वीसी सर के पास वो तो सबकी कहानी खुद ही बांटता रहेगा खुद ही समझनाता रहेगा तो क्लियर पिक्चर नहीं निकल के आएगी इनफैक्ट देर विल बी अ कंफ्यूजिंग पिक्चर सो इन सच अ केस वेर अ पर्टिकुलर आइटम इज लोडिंग वेरी हाई ऑन ऑल द कमिटीज drop that item. Data reduction technique. Remember, we have to get only the purest form of items. We have to take only the purest of items to the next stage or to the subsequent stage. So here, I'm going to be talking about only those items which are not having cross loadings. This particular phenomena, this phenomena is called as cross loading where the item is highly correlated with two or more factors. That means, wo aisa banda hai, jo do or more committees mein khub jato jahat se kaam kar raha hai, to uske liye teen hi case hai, ya aap usse ek committee mein consider kar lije, ya aap do committee mein, matab, dono mein consider kar lije, ya aap usse hata lije. So, the better way of doing it is, jiska jada value hai, jaha correlation high hai, to yaha pe PL1 uh, ki correlation is very high, with the uh, factor number four, so I would like to keep it for factor number four. But ye jo hai, uh, ye jo mohtarma hai, Miss Thirteen, she is contributing to almost every place and uh, not doing a good job with us. So let's see if removing her can help us come to a better cumulative variance. The idea is to increase the cumulative variance, have the minimized number of factors. Remember, we have to have a parsimonious parsimonious model. What is a parsimonious model? Where we are trying to get the maximum output with the minimum input. So minimum input means minimum factor if we can define kar sake construct ko, iski, uh, 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 factorization ko, perfect. That is what is our objective. So we go back and we remove uh, PLM 13. I think it was um, 13. So if I remove this particular item and check now, what is the situation? So, though the KMO has gone down, but not really down, let's see what is the cumulative variance has gone up. 74.177. Can you see this? So, actually from 73, this particular item was actually creating problem. So, inko yaha pe chhod dena chahiye. Aur dekhte hai, component, uh, the rotated component mein kya pangde hai. So, yaha pe, uh, yaha pe hum isko PL8 ko isi mein consider kar lete hai. But uh, PL19 ko hum 
फैक्टर टू में कंसिडर करेंगे क्योंकि यहाँ पे लोडिंग पॉइंट सिक्स फाइव थ्री है विजावी द लोडिंग एट पॉइंट फोर एट सो वंस दिस लोडिंग इज हायर आई वुड लाइक टू कंसिडर इट हि पी एल एम फोर्टीन ये वाले जो जनाब है ये भी बड़े क्लोज क्लोज है आप देख रहे हैं पॉइंट फोर फाइव फोर फाइव वन सेवन एंड फोर जीरो सिक्स ही कैन बी द नेक्स्ट पर्सन हु कैन बी लेफ्ट आउट फॉर द मीटिंग एंड ऑल्सो दिस वन फोर सिक्स थ्री एंड फोर सिक्स फोर हम हर जगह काम कर रहे हैं और बहुत ही क्लोजली काम कर रहे हैं तो ये दोनों हटा के देखते हैं पहले हम पी एल एम फोर्टीन हटा के देखते हैं कि क्या होता है क्या हमारा रिजल्ट इम्प्रूव होता है and that is how you will have to come up to that is the reason it is called as an exploratory technique because we are exploring we are exploring how we can come up to the best possible parsimonious uh, uh, factorization schedule for our factor for our um, for our construct so we are here now i want to find out which one i had to reduce what was the number if you all can remember so pl PL थर्टीन था फोर्टीन था आई थिंक फोर्टीन था मैं इसको हटा देती हूँ और अब रन करके देखते हैं पॉइंट एट नाइन जीरो नॉट मच चेंज इन केमो लेट्स चेक द क्यूमुलेटिव वेरियंस क्यूमुलेटिव वेरियंस सेवेंटी फोर पॉइंट थ्री फाइव गॉन अप अगैन कई बार क्यूमुलेटिव वेरियंस बढ़ेगी नहीं मगर अगर किसी के हटाने से क्यूमुलेटिव वेरियंस नहीं बढ़ रही है तो फिर उसको रखने का कोई फायदा ही नहीं है सो आप हटा दीजिए उन्हें राइट so we should not see the component matrix we should basically talk about the rotated component matrix so abhi to abhi bhi hai panga hai 15 number mein ye dekhiye 0.464448401 so this this gentleman is again going to create us problem so 15 and um, uh, this is a uh, more or less clear because the jukav is more towards factor 2 and we will not delete this particular item however uh, this particular member pl1 is also very close by um, let's see with whether we would like to delete or not and let's see what we need to do so uh, let's first delete and find out uh, plm15 uh, if pl15 needs to be deleted and found out how things move for us so let's just remove this one also Eight nine six KMO has gone up. Uh, Ballot stretch of uh, test of sphericity is fine. All the values of communality are greater than point five, which is good enough. Let me just check seventy four point seven six three five से seven six हो गया है. Good enough. The rotated component cumulative variance is giving us good results. Rotated component matrix is talking about a much clearer picture today. And uh, if I were to uh, reduce uh, this. particular uh, case i am good to go with almost all that are there in my kitty so just let me see is there anybody else creating a problem so no there is no problem getting created here uh, there is no problem getting created here is there any other problem if you can tell me i would be really happy that you are able to tell me so uh, this particular yeah so we have only one that i think is creating a problem on the basis of communality ab communality ko check kare to ye 29 number ki abhi bhi 0.5 hai jabki baki sab ki bahut achhi hai to ek baar 29 ko hata ke dekhte hain nahi hoga to wapas dal denge koi problem nahi hai le chalenge meeting ke liye abhi hai 74.767 let me just go ahead and uh, check whether reducing this member is going to help me or not help me so i remove this member say okay run the test again 0.89.5.001 ka farak aaya koi khas farak nahi hai all the communality is very well in place and and the total variance explained goes up to 75.717 though it was contributing as a factor uh, at a, at a leak of about 0.7 but actual communality was low and hence that means what is communality all the factors brought together explaining that particular item so yes uh, 75% is the cumulative variance which is a very good variance in social sciences 50% se upar aapka kuch bhi agar variance aata hai to aapka scale good to go hai uh, we got this scale the component matrix looks uh, similar we can see some cross loadings here 
in order to make this chart a little bit neater, you remember I had suppressed less than 0.4. So if I suppress less than 0.5, I think my chart is going to become thinner. So let's see if I have to give it to the reviewer. If I have to give it to the reviewer, I have to give a clean chart. So let me see if this is working my way. So rotated component matrix now looks amazing. 0.51 hai ya bhi bhi hamare ko uh, cross loading pe dikha raha but it is perfectly fine. I can consider it in factor three because uh, it is uh, you know it is uh, basically uh, higher loading on factor three. You still want to uh, make it more clearer uh, in terms of the pictorial representation. Just make it 0.52 so that you do ko confusion na lage. Aap aise bhi chhod sakte hai. It is perfectly correct to give it uh, with a cross loading because the loading to factor 3 is much higher than the loading to factor 4. So 75.717% factor loading, eigenvalue greater than 1 to be um, retained. So we are talking about initial eigenvalues greater than 1. Uh, in five factors and five factors uh, ye hamare factorization aa gai hai, rotated component matrix. So uh, these are, there are uh, three or four things that we need to uh, display as tables. So when we are talking about tables that have to go for our uh, 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 tables that we have to show for our, uh, our paper, we need to display four tables. So let's see which are the four tables or we will the most important aspect pe aenge, which is called as naming, nomenclature, the last leg of EFA. And uh, naming also has to be done with the help of a lot of literature review. So uh, we are going to come to it. I generally name on the basis of conducting a focus group discussion. I don't name it on my own. I usually want experts to sit together, read through the statements and come up with a very uh, clear and robust factor name because that's going to be uh, your baby forever. You know, that's going to be your uh, uh, your scale forever and you're going to be validating it in the next lec. We, we use uh, partial least square structural equation modeling through Smart VLS 4 for uh, CFA and measurement model runs and uh, that we're going to do uh, post-lunch uh, once we are done with factorization of this particular sketch. So, uh, yes, uh, what are the tables that we need to give? So, if we go to slides, we didn't miss anything. We talked about KMO, we talked about extraction. There are three criteria for extraction. One is scree plot. How many factors extract? One is the eigenvalue. Eigenvalue greater than one. There are two criteria. Eigenvalue greater than one. We call it Kaiser criteria. Jolliff ne bhi diya tha, usne bola tha 0.7 se upar ho eigenvalue, toh bhi aap uh, us factor ko consider kar sakte hai. But uh, uh, the normal parallance is eigenvalue greater than 1 and we would like to stick to eigenvalue greater than 1. Uh, cumulative variance, uh, social science ke liye 0.6 se upar ho ni chahiye. 0.95 for pure science. What, what is meant by pure science? Because in pure science, you're talking about medicine. You're talking about actual experimentation. Waha pe 75% um, hi agar explain ho raha hai, toh cheek nahi hai. Uh, it should be greater than 90%, 95% in fact. This is given by Herodot 1995. One more graphical technique hai to identify kitne factors. So this graphical technique you can see this. This is the uh, scree plot uh, technique where you plot, uh, there is an option of the scree plot and you can uh, check the point of inflection. So depending on the point of inflection, you would decide on the number of factors. Look at ये अपने आप ये लाइन चल रही है और ये यहाँ आके थोड़ी सी स्टेबल हो गई यहाँ पे आके सिमिलर हो गई रेंज हैज बिकम अ लिटिल फ्लैट इट हैज बिकम अ लिटिल फ्लैट द इट इट इज नो मोर इन एन एंगल ऑफ फॉर्मेट इट हैज बिकम अ लिटिल फ्लैट सो दिस इज द पॉइंट ऑफ इन्फ्लेक्शन यहाँ से ये चेंज हो रही है एक तो ये पॉइंट ऑफ इन्फ्लेक्शन है तो दो फैक्टर तो नहीं है इसके बाद ये पॉइंट ऑफ इन्फ्लेक्शन है दिस इज टॉकिंग अबाउट थ्री फैक्टर्स एक ये पॉइंट ऑफ इन्फ्लेक्शन है फोर फैक्टर्स सो According to the screen plot, it is saying that either you would have uh, three, uh, four or five factors. But when we actually worked out our work uh, through, the, uh, through the software that is SPSS, we found that it was actually uh, five factors. We came down to five factors. And that is where uh, we decided on keeping on all the five factors in place. So fair enough. Let's go back and uh, find out 
what all uh, what all uh, things we need to talk about in the next go so we did this rotation हमने बताया दो तरह की रोटेशन होती है ऑब्लिक और ऑर्थोगनल ऑर्थोगनल रोटेशन तब होती है जब फैक्टर्स अनकोरिलेटेड हमें चाहिए राइट right? हमने कहा कि हमें अनकोरिलेटेड फैक्टर्स चाहिए सो हम वेरीमैक्स करते हैं वट इज वेरीमैक्स टू इट मिनिमाइज द नंबर ऑफ वेरिएबल्स दैट हैव हाई लोड तो वो क्या करता है वो एक स्क्रीनिंग टेक्निक है जो कहता है भैया सारे लोग नहीं जा सकते वाइस चांसलर के पास वो रजिस्ट्रार है वो ये डिसाइड करेगा कि कौन कौन जाएगा तो ये कहते हैं कि नंबर ऑफ फैक्टर्स हैविंग हाई लोडिंग शुड बी मिनिमाइज इट वर्क्स ऑन दिस प्रिंसिपल एंड इट वर्क्स टू मेक स्मॉलर लोडिंग्स इवन वेरी स्मॉल सो इट रोटेट्स द डेटा इन सच अ मैनर दैट पीपल हैविंग हाई लोडिंग आर गेटिंग अ सफिशिएंटली हाई लोडिंग एंड द नंबर ऑफ पीपल आर लिमिटेड एंड द पीपल हैविंग लो लोडिंग्स आर हैविंग ऑल द मोर लो लोडिंग्स सो दैट दे कैन बी डिस्कार्डेड सो दैट इज वेरीमैक्स रोटेशन अकॉर्डिंग टू वेरीमैक्स रोटेशन इन कंपैरिजन टू इक्विमैक्स वी गिव बोथ इक्वल प्रोपोर्शन टू बोथ रोटेशंस एंड क्वार्टीमैक्स इट मिनिमाइजेस द नंबर ऑफ फैक्टर्स इक्विमैक्स में नंबर ऑफ फैक्टर्स और नंबर ऑफ लोडिंग्स इक्वल इक्वलाइज करने की कोशिश करते हैं क्वार्टीमैक्स में वी मिनिमाइज द नंबर ऑफ फैक्टर्स टू एक्सप्लेन ईच वेरिएबल बट uh, uh, हमें वो वाले फैक्टर्स चाहिए जिनकी लोडिंग भी हाई हो जो काम करने वाले लोग हैं इसीलिए हम वेरेमैक्स पे जाते हैं सो वेरेमैक्स इज द आइडियल चॉइस फॉर रोटेशन यू कैन हैव टू टाइप्स ऑफ रोटेशन यू कैन आल्सो डू ऑब्लिक रोटेशन सो देर इज डायरेक्ट प्रॉब्लम एंड प्रोमैक्स रोटेशन बट यस वी गो इन फॉर ऑर्थो गिनल रोटेशन बिकॉज ऑब्लिक रोटेशन प्रोड्यूस फैक्टर्स विच आर सिमिलर सो इफ यू डूंग प्रिंसिपल एक्सेस फैक्टरिंग प्रॉब्लम यू लाइक टू गो फॉर ऑब्लिक रोटेशन so these were the options uh, this was the suppression ye dekhi humne 0.5 se less karke isko sort by size kar diya tha aur ab aa gaye hum nomenclature pe so what is nomenclature ab karenge hum namkaran magar hame kitni uh, wo dekhani hoti hai tables isko hum dekh lete hain apne uh, sheet pe ki kaun kaun si tables deni hongi hame for the research uh, probability so uh, you can see this the first table that you have to give is kmo bartlett this table is very very important because it uh, i uh, underlines it checks your underlying assumptions so what are the underlying assumptions underlying assumption is of kmo greater than 0.6 which is going to be good 0.8 se upar hai bahut hi badhiya hai 0.9 se upar hai best hai aapke liye aapke sample ki adequacy totally hai and uh, sampling kaise humne decide ki thi on the basis of n is to p ke ratio so p is the number of uh, uh, items and uh, n is 3 times so uh, um, we are talking about for every item i should have three respondents it's like this 3 to 1 ke ratio pe apan kaam karte hain and uh, bartlett test of sphericity null hypothesis just to recap the null hypothesis is there is no correlation between items ye sare log ip ke nahi hai magar aisa to hai nahi hame use reject karna hai jaise hi wo reject hoga हम अपना ईएफए रन कर सकते हैं सो नॉट हाइपोथेसिस इज आइटम्स आर नॉट कोरिलेटेड एंड यू टेंड टू गिव अ सिग्निफिकेंट वैल्यू ऑफ बार्टलेट टेस्ट ऑफ स्पेरिसिटी कंफर्म्स दैट वी कैन रन द ईएफए टेक्निक देन ऑफ कोर्स द सेकंड दैट यू हैव टू गो गिव इज द कम्युनलिटी टेबल यहां पे कम्युनलिटी टेबल हमने मिस कर दिया है बट आपको देना चाहिए यूजुअली जब आप ईएफए सीएफए का पेपर लिखते हो स्केल का पेपर लिखते हो तो हम कम्युनलिटी टेबल स्किप कर लेते हैं बिकॉज़ दैट इज अ Uh, taken uh, as uh, as understood that you will take a commonality greater than 0.5 so yahan pe jo commonality table hame dikh raha tha remember this was the commonality table you go up again this is the commonality table so commonality is, is how all the factors together are explaining a particular item so this commonality table is all the values should be of the uh, extraction should be greater than 0.5 so initial extraction is one Uh, for uh, everybody becomes a part of every community and uh, that is where the extraction is going to be 0.5 so 0.5 se upar hona chahiye that is another table that you can give and the third table that you should give is rotated component table so this is the rotated component table that we gave for student well being similarly um, it will give you some details of how many rotations did the iterations co uh, converged in so these are the iterations and uh, we were here on positive leadership and the output of positive leadership was uh, where did the output go yeah we are here on the yeah so uh, the third table that you have to explain is the 
you can skip the components table it is not uh, it is before rotation what uh, how the different items are moving you would see that it is loading absolutely on the first factor so rotated component helps you to identify the minimal possible factors such that uh, people with a higher load the items with a higher loading for a particular factor are made a little more higher and the minimal loadings are made a little lower so that the clarification the the picture is much more clearer so that is the reason we go for varimax and this is the rotated component matrix. So one, two, three, four, five. Ab karte hai hum iska naam karan. Aap ne dekha tha yaha pe, uh, we are now on the nomenclature. What is nomenclature? Naming the factors can be problematic and hence should be done very carefully on the basis of the literature review and the focus group. I repeat, on the basis of literature review. Now where do you have to go? Go back to your dimensionality thing. Check the dimensionality table and see uh, which all uh, names were coming very prevalent, which were very, uh, you know, uh, dominating over the others. Remember the row, read the row and see which names were very important and you would not like to miss out on those names. So there is where we should do the, uh, you know, you should uh, be doing the nomenclature. Uh, I used a focus group to do the nomenclature. So if you realize we are here to do the nomenclature now so uh, if i were to talk about scale purification you've already had scale purification here here on the basis of literature review and on the basis of and on the basis of fgg you will be able to name your factors so now you will give name to your factors and this will complete the study too that is, now you have completed the exploratory part of the scale development. And now you can go in with your factors. The scale is finalized. And whatever four items we drop, we can just drop those items out of 29. Four to five items were dropped. And final list of items should be taken for study three, which is going to be the uh, bigger data collection. Now, one thing that all of us should keep into mind is that never ever have the same sample for EFA and CFA. So you should always have a newer sample. It's, that is the reason it is called as study three. So um, in the study three, we recollect the data, of course, keeping our research design in mind. So here now you have to be at the pilot stage, at the EFA stage, you can have a heterogeneous sample. So you can get it filled from whosoever you want to, but try and have a, a mix of the research design. The combination should be near to the research design. But in case of study three, where you're collecting the final data, there you have to be, have to be very careful to pick on your research design as you had proposed in your synopsis. So now we are now going to be, if, if I'm talking about these many number of management students, these many number of technical students from public, private and deemed um, uh, specifically for every category, then I have to stick to those categories. I have to stick to those numbers. I have to stick to those numbers so that I can come up to do my EFA. So uh, the next stage is going to be uh, scale validation. And the scale validation has to be followed up by nomological validity and generalizability, which completes our complete process of scale development. Right, so we are right now here, we are on purification. Now we will validate it for the new study, but in purification, what we have not done so far is naming our factors. So let's go back and find out what are the names that we can give. Let's do on a real time basis. So this was my rotated component matrix and my uh, name of the, uh, uh, the, the construct that I'm trying to explore the factorization schedule for is positive leadership. So positive leadership is defined by factor number one. Let's read. Let's read the items and come up to what it means. My leader is committed to continuous lifelong learning. My leader is actively involved in research work. My leader expresses positive attitudes to implementing new ideas for teaching. My leader is passionate about research work conducted by the faculty. My leader shows willing to learn new things. My leader always promotes new projects. My leader is a change initiator. If you realize all these questions are moving around something which is new, 
either uh, talking about how leader can be a change agent, how leader can be uh, having some orientation so that the newness in the research, in projects, in uh, lifelong learning can be introduced. So can I call it innovation orientation? Yes. Here, all the six or the seven items that we are talking about is actually reflective of uh, the innovation orientation of a leader. And that is where I would call, I would like to call it innovation orientation. I go back to my dimension table, check whether innovation orientation was a dimension or not, and whether how many, how many authors have been theoretically been talking about it. If actually people are talking about it in great numbers and the percentage contribution of this dimension has been great, then I would like to call it innovation orientation. Let's go to the next. Let's go to the next one. The next one is talking about my leader considers all of his options in a situation. My leader simplifies complex situations. My leader is capable of making sense of ambiguous situation. So, support situation, situation, children. Can you see this? We are talking about uh, my leader listens carefully to different points of views before coming to conclusions. So, he is able to consider all our options. He simplifies the situation. He is able to uh, take charge of ambiguity in situation. He listens carefully to different points of view. So he will analyze an alternative course of action only on the basis of whatever points of view people have. My leader is open to input even from those who oppose him. So, no, this was for uh, the next one. My leader is good at crisis handling. So all this is basically talking or reflective of decisiveness of the leader. So if you realize it is talking about how good the leader is at decision making. So considering all options, all alternatives. Remember the decision-making process? So it uh, takes charge of the situation, handling complex situation, handling ambiguous situations, careful to everybody's point of view. So selecting and evaluating alternatives threadbare. So that's a part of the rational decision-making process. So again, now I would go back to the dimension table, ass assess whether this particular term, this dimension was taken up as an important dimension by the other authors theoretically or generically in the uh, set of things, in the scheme of things. And that is where I would like to now call it decisiveness. Let's go to the third one. My leader often compliments me for good work. My leader recognizes my strong and weak sides. My leader recognizes the abilities and skills of faculty members in my department. My leader, this is basically positive leadership uh, per, pertaining to faculty. So that is my department. My leader recognizes the abilities and skills of faculty members. My leader praises members for their job performance. So if you realize this is something to do with teamwork and to be precise, the leader is very, very categorical in uh, contributing to the dimension of team appreciation. So the third dimension that we think is appropriate in this category of positive leadership is team appreciation. So team appreciation, again, the drill is the same. Go to the dimension table, check whether theoretically it has been established. If yes, you can go ahead and call it team appreciation. So now when you come to the fourth, uh, you are talking about my leader explains most of the decisions. My leader gives all faculty members a chance to express. Uh, my leader is uh, actively shares. So here we are talking majorly about communication. So when you're talking about communication, it is basically dealing with uh, uh, how a leader communicates, whether he shares all the information, whether he gives them a chance to speak or not, whether he uh, explains whatever and why he has taken a particular decision. So basically it is talking about clear communication style of the leader. So we would call it clear communication. Repeat the drill, go to the dimension table, check whether it is there or not. And now we come to the last but not the least. I'm not adjust according to mistakes that I make. Uh, the leader has the freedom to, uh, we have a freedom to make a mistake. I'm usually forgiven for my mistake. And if I commit a mistake, my leader gives me a second chance. 
So uh, basically, this is talking about forgiveness attitude of the leader, uh, that our leader is trying to, uh, is not very um, penalty oriented, uh, he's not vengeance oriented, and he would like to give some leeway to uh, people in terms of forgiving them for the kind of work that they are doing and for the kind of mistakes that they have been committing. So again, the drill remains the same. We go back to the dimension table, check whether this particular variable has been there, incorporated there in theory and practice in terms of the FGDs. And now you come up to a conclusion of what should be the naming terminology for uh, this particular segment. So if you talk about positive leadership, positive leadership was a construct which had five factors. So we were able to, through EFA, after EFA, we were able to come up to five factors. The first was called as innovation orientation. This was the biggest factor. Uh, it had the maximum variance and eigenvalue also highest. Then the second factor was decisiveness. So we are talking about how decisive was the leader. The third factor was uh, team appreciation. So we are talking about how the leader is able to uh, appreciate the team and uh, take them along together. The fourth factor was clear communication. And the fifth factor was uh, forgiveness. So now, after my exploratory factor analysis, I have been able to explore a factorization schedule such that my positive leadership as a construct under the leadership concept has been easily factorized through EFA and all the FDDs in study two in terms of innovation orientation, decisiveness, team appreciation, clear communication, and forgiveness. In other words, if I can say I can actually define my positive leader as a person who is innovation oriented, decisive, appreciative of his team, has clear communication and forgiveness. So what have I given to the world back? I have given a scale of how a positive, what are the traits of a positive leader? Or how would you be able to define a positive leader? The pilot, the first level testing statistically is complete. Now we go in for the next level testing and that level testing is going to be validating whatever we have just made. So this particular aspect of validation of the scale is nothing but um, the, uh, the, we, are, we will be trying to do another study. Now I come to study four, so study three. So we are now going to come to study three. We are now going to validate or confirm the dimensions that we have just made. And that we will continue after, I think, uh, the break because it is already 1.20. Um, uh, let us just now take a break. Uh, uh, Sunita, ma'am, if it is okay, we can take a break for lunch and we can come back by two sharp so that we can uh, start our uh, last session of uh, validation, nomological validity, and generalizability. So is that okay? Is, are we okay with it? Any queries? You can please ask me as many queries as you want. If you have any, otherwise we can wait for the, we can stop here for the next session. Over to you, Dr. Sunita. Dr. Sunita, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we can break for lunch and we can come back. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for explaining such in a nice way. Thank you so much. I, when I was also reviewing myself with the all factor analysis and all that. So you simplify it very well. And I hope everybody is going to take it very positively. And I okay. think now we can proceed for the lunch, ma'am. We will come back at 2 for the last session, 2 to 3.30. Yes, yes, ma'am. I will be introducing a new software to all of you uh, in the next session. I will be giving you, I can't give you a hands-on. If you have the time, please download Smart KLS 4. For your systems, you can uh, download the uh, test version or the student's version and you can have the feel and look of the software on your screen as well. So you can do that during lunchtime and uh, we 
Thank you. Sure, ma'am. We will be back at two. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.
पर्सनल क्या क्या लाइएगा वो हमेशा चलते लगेगा so uh, welcome back uh, we are at the last leg like, of our lecture and uh, now we are going to be approaching the the last three steps that is scale validation nomological validity and generalizability for uh, today and that's all about uh, this session and uh, i hope whatever i have talked so far has made some coherent sense to you and in case it has, uh, now we're going to go to finalize on uh, how to validate the scale that we have constructed with so much of effort uh, using uh, so many focus group interviews and uh, mixed method researches and then conducting the pilot through an exploratory fact analysis. And now we are at a stage where we would like to go in for, uh, where we would like to go in for uh, validation of the scale that we have just formulated. Now, I told you uh, there are three aspects to scale development. So whenever we are talking about scales, you can adopt, you can adapt, and you can construct. So uh, again, the, uh, the only thing that I'm reiterating it here, uh, we are talking about uh, EFA plus CFA, whenever you are constructing a skill. Uh, in an adaption, uh, you need to do just the CFA. In the adoption, again, you need to do just the CFA. So there is no EFA here. There is no uh, EFA here. But if you talk about EFA and CFA, both are ticked here. So we have to be very careful as to what is the process that we are adopting. And on the basis of the process, we might just decide on either of the three. So uh, since I am uh, doing uh, scale construction, and uh, this is the entire process of scale construction, I would go on point number three, wherein I would conduct both the EFA and the CFA. The EFA we've just done through scale purification, and uh, we did exploratory fact analysis uh, using uh, uh, principal component analysis, PCA. And uh, we also named our factors uh, for positive leadership construct. These were the five factors that we named. And now we are on scale validation. So uh, again, a quick recap. We are talking about uh, talking about the uh, scale, the construct, then TCM ADO, framework-based, um, SLR, dimensionality, select dimensions, item generation, item analysis, content analysis, scale purification, scale validation, nomological validity, and generalizability to, to end the entire process of scale development. So uh, let me come here. So we are here at the uh, third uh, study stage. So now since it was a mixed study method, this is now uh, you need to conduct data, you need to collect data again for study three when you're talking about scale uh, validation. And what is scale validation and how do you do it? Uh, so you're using different processes of uh, uh, 
uh, uh, measurement model and path modeling uh, through your structural equation modeling softwares. So uh, one of one such software is uh, Smart PLS 4. And uh, how do you go about searching for that software? So I will tell you how easy it is. So uh, if you go to the uh, to Google and uh, say Smart PLS. So you all you need to do is go to Google and say Smart PLS 4. And you would see that it will show you download Smart PLS. So the, the latest release, uh, release is 4.2.9.8. Uh, you click on this and uh, what you will get is this screen. So you can actually uh, take a free 30 days trial, uh, which is uh, definitely IP address based. So for a laptop, you can have a 30 day trial. Uh, you can uh, download uh, for Windows, 64 uh, bit Windows. You can download for Mac also and uh, uh, for uh, Apple Silicon on Intel both. So you can just go in for uh, which of the options suits you as for your configuration of the system. You can also do it for Linux, uh, that is Linux installer. You will have to download first to download Smart PLS 4. This is the icon of Smart PLS 4. This software is basically uh, uh, being uh, uh, publicized and uh, uh, promoted by uh, Professor Christian Ringel, Professor Marcos Arsted, and we have a whole team of uh, Professor Becker, Professor uh, uh, Danks, and uh, many others who are working uh, tirelessly behind the software to give us uh, such ease. This software has actually, this is variance-based SEM, which is very different from covariance-based SEM. So Amos, as we used to use earlier, used um, uh, variance-based SEM. The one good thing about Amos was that you could work on uh, variance based SEM without, uh, uh, you know, you can you could work on the measurement model of an individual construct. So if I'm talking about uh, uh, student well-being, or if I'm talking about alumni giving behavior, and I'm talking about any of these models, I could run my covariance based model for a single construct. In case of smart PLS, however, we work in totality. So the entire model runs in one go such that the measurement model and the structural model also runs in go. The path model also runs in one go. So that is the reason you have to be very careful in case of uh, the smart PLS. So before we go up to smart PLS, uh, let me just uh, quickly recap uh, what was our model so that I can introduce smart PLS to you. And uh, yeah, so what was my model? Uh, my model was uh, going back to the model that we had yesterday, we said we will be working on alumni satisfaction. Alumni satisfaction was, this is just a quick recap, alma mater experience and career assistance. These were the two sub-dimensions of factors that we had for uh, alumni satisfaction. Each of them had few items. So uh, this was uh, basically how uh, we measured the first sets of the scale, which is ASAT. And when I talked about these uh, scales, uh, there was another dependent variable which ASAT led to, which was called as alumni giving behavior. Now, the difference between alumni uh, satisfaction and alumni giving behavior was that alumni uh, is, is, was in type of the scales or, of sub-dimensions that they had. For example, at uh, uh, at the subdimension or the LOC level, so we we were talking about uh, uh, charitable giving behavior. We talked about uh, professional giving behavior. We talked about a uh, financial giving behavior, and we talked about social giving behavior. And each of them had their own items, and uh, we referred to them in terms of. Uh, two-stage modeling approach because there were two stages which were using which were being used to calculate AGB. Similarly, two stages here. Uh, so if you realize this was stage one and this was stage two. Similarly, this was stage one and this was stage two. So this, this was a two-stage approach also known as a disjoint approach and we, we're going to be uh, coming to it uh, very soon. Then we had another uh, construct which was called as alumni citizenship behavior. This was a very simple construct because it was based out of a few I, uh, items and that is the reason we had uh, this as an LOC 
that is the lower order construct it was at two stages so hoc that is a higher order construct it was also a higher order construct the difference between asat and agb was asat was a reflective reflective construct agb was reflective formative construct so it was reflective here and formative here and it was reflective here and also reflective here so uh, we already talked about the reflective and formative skills this was acb was a reflective construct uh, at the loc level so uh, basically this model as we did yesterday just a recap uh, this was having different measurement models or cfa models on their own that were being uh, talked about so we had the agb model this was and the asat model and also to accompany it was the acb model so yes here we go this was your measurement model 1 measurement model 2 measurement model 3 and to talk about uh, the measurement models this was also called as outer model this was also called as outer model this was also called as outer model we are doing a brief brief recap because as i move to the software uh, this picture should be clear in your mind okay so uh, here we are talking about the outer models also this was this is better known as confirmatory factor analysis cfa cfa so that is what we are doing here in this case now to talk about the inner model we are talking about these relationships which are being divine uh, designed by these yellow arrows so if you realize these are the three arrows that are talking about my inner model model which will be picking it pick, picking up values for acb asat and agb on a disjoint approach usually the hypothesis is on the inner model so actually i have three hypotheses in this model h1 h2 and h3 so basically i would be talking about beta 1 beta 2 and beta 3 so if i realize the blue the blue, the blue box is talking about my inner model which is going to be the sem model i i would uh, prefer to call it the sem model so this was a measurement model this was the sem so this is where we are going to be at the disjoint approach working at the inner model level so this is the inner model donation scheme kuch donation kuch aur donation na ab aap mute kar diya kijiye sunita ji if you can hear the sound so uh this is what uh, the this is the placement of the definite scales that we have here is where we are going to be running the hypothesis right so no hypothesis on this this was a reflective reflective scale this was a reflective formative scale so we talked about reflective and formative uh, very clearly on the basis of four uh, things that we were talking about now what we need to do when we are establishing or validating scales the most important thing that we need to identify is one reliability and two validity these are the two things that we are looking forward to while we are confirming the scale or validating the scale so validation at that particular juncture in the mm model requires discussion on reliability and validity these are the two things that we need uh, to discuss uh, when we are talking about a scale so let me now introduce you to the uh, latest software i have already got it downloaded and i have a licensed version so yes uh, there are certain things that can be computed the licensed version uh, so if you get to get a hang of the licensed version that will be the best for you so we are moving on to uh, smart plus 4 this is the interface of smart plus 4 it's a partial least square structural equation modeling uh, software given by um the developers professor uh, ringel and uh, marco and uh, we are uh, happy and thankful that uh, they have always been assisting us to promote uh, training in the area of smart plus 4 uh, 
uh, in India. So we are uh, really putting all our, uh, uh, you know, efforts together to train the Indians in this particular software. So uh, this software has a lot of advantages. One, it uh, you can do uh, quasi-experimental designs on this software. You can do predictive modeling on the software. The first and the foremost and the most robust uh, that helps me and that makes uh, this software my favorite over other softwares is because it helps in dealing with uh, formatted constructs. In Amos, you cannot deal with formatted constructs. Another good advantage is uh, if you are having scales which are very, very, uh, which are having two statements, you know, uh, there also the software uh, is robust, it can run. And um, uh, since it is various based SEM, so it actually uh, is a software that talks about uh, multiple uh, unobserved heterogeneity, observed heterogeneity, and multiple things that you can do with the software. So just to expose you to the screen, the, this, this particular uh, menu is talking about uh, the smart PLS files. So here, here we have the license preferences and the updates. Of course, if you have a license file, then you need to go through uh, switch license, put up the license if you buy the software, and then you can go and put up your license. And many of these um, uh, menu bars, which are otherwise, uh, you know, you can it can be uh, for access to you. These are the different files that you can have. Uh, these are the different options that are there um, in the menu, which are also here in the form of shortcut icons. So if you have to make a new project, you can click on this blue icon. If you want to talk about and run PLSM, this is the icon that we talk about. The good part about 4.0.9.8 is that uh, we can uh, actually, uh, I think that's the version that we have. We have... Uh, which version are we talking about? Half a point, oh point nine point eight. So uh, uh, this version talks about even CV SEM, so uh, covariance based SEM. So things that you would able to do in Amos. So sometimes uh, for common method bias, uh, the uh, the viewers ask you that you should prepare a latent construct and try to check the common method bias over and above the marker variable. So their common uh, the CV SEM is of great use. And um, a process macro, his process macro, his has given us multiple models and process macros can be run through uh, this also. Another good thing about uh, this particular thing is that we can run regression models. So regression models, uh, you can run uh, latest techniques of uh, regression models. Uh, you can run NCA, you can run, um, uh, you know, you can uh, uh, NC permutations you can run and find out uh, the necessary condition analysis for uh, which is applicable to a particular model and a construct. So the first thing that we try to do here is we, if you start on the first go uh, with your laptops, you should first create a new workspace. A workspace will help you to uh, save on your files uh, directly go, you know, they can only appear here as projects. Um, now when you open the software, this will all be waiting for you. This will all be right for you. Since I have had so many uh, projects, so yes, uh, this looks like this for me. But it's okay. We can create a new project. So let's say, let's give it uh, Ramanujan. Let's call it uh, Ramanujan Workshop. So that was the pro uh, project. And we will be talking about AGB. So let's create a new project. And if you see, as soon as you create a new project, a new file gets created here. Once this file gets created, now what you need to do is you need to import your data file. So where is the data file? You you must have stored your data file at particular places. So what I've been going to do is I'm going to um, go to my day two module and here I have data set alumni giving 580 and I open it. If you see the data file, the, the software itself will show you your data files. In fact, on the first screen itself, it shows you what kind of a scale is it, what is the minimum and the maximum. It also talks about uh, what were the different uh, options that are there. You can, in this particular software, import CSV files, Excel files, uh, SAV files, any any kind of files which are basically metrics based. So uh, when you're talking about this, you can uh, talk about what kind of scales are there. 
and if there is a missing value however this uh, software is very sensitive to missing values so we have to be very careful that there are no missing values in the software so you have to be um, very 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 careful that uh, no missing values are there also the names the names that we have for all these put together the names that we have for all the uh, all the fields put together should not be similar. For example, if this is CA2, if I change here to CA2, you will see that the import button gets deactivated. That means if you have two columns with the same name, this will not get activated. So in order to make it correct, I will do a CA3 and I can now import the file. Once my data is absolutely clean, it has no missing values, I would go ahead and import the file. So let me go ahead and let me see, is there any other option? So we import the file and now you've got a file that will get attached here. See, so this is the file type that we have. It is giving you all the descriptive statistics, which otherwise you had to run on SPSS on a different node in one go. So see, uh, you are talking about gender. This is the first uh, field on your file. The type is 01, that is, this is binary. So zero is for female, one is for male. Missing values are zero. These are the mean, this is the median, this is the scale minimum, maximum, observed mean, observed maximum, standard deviation, ketosis, skewness. So you can actually talk about uh, your normality uh, thing. Now it, uh, uh, the good part about smart KLS is that not normal data and small data sets can also be run on it. You can definitely run bigger data sets, but small data sets are a problem in Amos and uh, uh, Amos. And that is the reason we um, we find uh, smart KLS for a little more comfortable. So when you're talking about uh, uh, the null hypothesis here in this case to check the normality of data, uh, you need to just go to this value. Kramer's Vaughn misses P value. So Kramer 1 misses p-value is a test that checks the normality hypothesis that data is normal. The normality hypothesis uh, for data being normal is, data, uh, we say null hypothesis is data is normal. So when this null hypothesis is the significance value is 0 0.000, what we are trying to say is our data is not normal. So yes, data is not normal in this case, but that's okay because I'm using smart PLS. And um, that's where uh, even if my data is not normal, I am good to go with this software. So if you realize uh, there are 44 indicators and there are 584 samples, if you talk about indicators, we've got all the listing. If you want to see the raw data, this is how the raw data is going to look. This looks exactly like your SPSS file or an Excel sheet or an Excel SX file or a SAV file that you must have stored. Uh, one thing that I, uh, I want to uh, share with you is that uh, be very careful on the naming of uh, your coding of your uh, Just give me a second, guys. This is very urgent. Just give
Yeah, so we were talking about this uh, uh, file. Uh, see, uh, when we're talking about how to code the file, it will become very easy. Life will become very easy for you if you code the file in a particular format. For example, how I code my files are, uh, for example, question number one belongs to AE and is actually a part of ASAT. So what I will do is I will code question number one as, I will code question number one as ASAT underscore AE underscore one. I will code question number two as ASAT underscore AE underscore two. I will quote question number three as ASAT underscore AE underscore three. Now, this is how you would, uh, we would know that basically these question one, two, three are a part of AE aspect or AE factor of ASAT. So if I have to quote four, five, six, it is very clear. So question number four, we coded as ASAT underscore CA underscore one. Question number five, we will talk about ASAT underscore CA underscore two. Question number six talks about ASAT underscore CA underscore three. So this is how we should do our coding. And if you realize in this particular software, I have done all the codings like this. If you see the indicators, check the indicators. See, these are the three questions for ASAT, then three questions for CA and uh, three questions then we are talking about ACB, ACB five questions. Then we are talking about CGB, which is a part of AG. So these are the three questions for CGB. These are the four questions for PGB. And this is how I've done my coding. If you do your coding like this, it will become very easy for you to formulate your model. Very easy. So let's see how we go about it. So we've already done the grammar rule. These are the correlations, inter uh, indicator correlation that will be there. So all the indicator correlations will be here if you realize. So if you want to see the correlations of ASAT with its other members, these this is the correlation that is already there. The table is already available to you. And you can see the correlations with the other, mem uh, other uh, correlations and the significances that are there. So uh, now since the data file, when, get, when it gets attached, it shows like a green stack. This green stack is representing a data file, a data set for alumina giving behavior. Now we will do next, what we want to do next is we will create a model. So uh, model type is PLSM. We want to create a PLSM model and I will call it AGB. So AGB, this is the first model of AGB that I want to get created. I want to create and this is how my uh, screen is going to look like. I will just shift it here so that I have enough space to create my own model. So now what do I need to do is, you remember the model that was there? This was the model that we have to create. This is the model that we have to create on the Smart PLS4 uh, uh, software. So let's go here. Now I pick ASAT, AE and AE3, AE123. There were three items to ASAT, AE. I put them here and I press enter. I got this. Have you got it? Now I can, this is the bot, uh, uh, let's understand this menu. This is the back button. This is the save button. This is the calculate button, most important button where you would have all the calculations for all possible uh, uh, operations that you can run on uh, the Smart PLS uh, software, Smart PLS for software. This is the select button. This will highlight a particular, once you select a particular and you want to create, conduct an operation on a particular subconstruct, LOC or HOC, then we need to activate this button. This is where we would like to create a latent variable. I'll show you when do we create a latent variable. This is connect. This will help you draw the lines in between the inner model. And of course, this, these are the quadrating, moderating effects, goes in copula and many other uh, effects. So I would select, go to the select button. I want to select ASAT AE, right click. See, it says align indicators to the left. I'm just trying to make a beautiful model. So I have aligned indicators to the left. Let me also take CA. CA was the third category, uh, the second uh, uh, So we are talking about, yeah, we could not, uh, 
regret because we are, you have to be very careful in selection. So these are the three items that we wanted to select. And this is ASAT CA. Again, click, right click, uh, invert uh, align indicators to the left. The software is very, very robust in terms of giving you natural alignment. So let's see, how does it give natural alignment? Let's go get this uh, model, beautify this model a little more. So I, I will just try and put this model in a better place. Yeah, so now my model is aligned. Now I need to also create a latent variable. Remember, uh, at the HOC level, there was a latent variable that we needed to create. So I'm putting my latent variable here. I am calling it alumni satisfaction. So this is alumni satisfaction. And uh, since alumni satisfaction also has to be, there is a, a repeated indicator approach is being followed in Smart PLS 4, whereby all the indicators at the LOC level also have to form or also have to be aligned to uh, the higher order indicator. So we put all of them here. We say right click, we select them. We say like right click and we come up to uh, hide indicators because we really don't need them. I want to connect the indicators. This was a reflective, reflective model. So the arrow is from the indicator to the construct. The arrow is from the indicator to the LOC, from the HOC to the LOC. So this has completed the measurement model of my ASAT. Now I come to ACB. ACB was just five indicators. It was a unidimensional construct. So I pick it up, I drop it, drag it here. And this is how ACB looks. To make it look a little more beautiful, what I do is I will align the indicators on the top. So I've aligned the indicators to the top. And this has not gone blue because it is yet not connected to any of the constructs. Now let's quickly make uh, uh, our third uh, model for the third uh, uh, construct. So this is alumni giving behavior through the charitable giving behavior. Also, we have... Uh, Professional giving behavior, we've been talking about it uh, since long. So there are four questions in professional giving behavior. We drag and we drop, right? So uh, this is where you can just uh, align them. This is uh, alumni giving behavior, uh, CGB, that is charitable giving behavior. This is professional giving behavior. Going beyond professional giving behavior, we had SGB. So SGP is, again, a combination of three statements at the LOC level. I drag and drop them here and press enter and align them to this particular mode. We are having our SGP and beyond SGP was FGB. FGB has, if you see, five indicators. So we have taken these five indicators and we have pressed it here. Let's align this here and we are going to, what we can do is we can put it up here or, yes, if the canvas becomes smaller, this is a small model. And if the canvas is smaller, there is something which is here where you can zoom. So this is at a hundred percent zoom. Can you see this bar? So at this particular juncture, press this and make it smaller. Now it is absolutely visible and absolutely acceptable to us. Now we need to draw the connection. So another latent variable we had to create. So this is AGB. So I would call it AGB. And this is where is my latent variable. If you realize the latent variable of this, the measurement model of AGB was reflective formatted. So reflective at this age, uh, at this stage and formative. So the arrow is from the lower order construct to the higher order construct. Why? Because the higher order construct is being formed by the 
lower order cholesterol. So this is how I am going to be forming my AGB. Also, I told you since it is a repeated indicator approach, all these indicators which form a part of AGB, uh, uh, different aspects of AGB also need to go uh, for calculation of AGB. Of course, we uh, select them and we hide them. So for us to become model very simple. So we just hide these indicators at this level. Now, what we need to do is we need to draw uh, the interconnections between ASAT and AGB. So this is how ASAT and AGB should be interconnected, ACB to this, and this was our primary model. So if you realize, we have now just created a model which is talking about, which is absolutely aligned. And now we are having three measurement models. So this is measurement model one, this is measurement model two, this is measurement model three. When we run at the first go, we only get output for the measurement models. For getting output of the inner model, we will have to, I repeat, we will have to check and store the LSV values. Why? Because right now, this computation only is happening. In order that this computation happens, we need to store our LSV scores and take it to the uh, next level model. And only then should we read the reliability and validity of those models in that particular format. What I mean is we are going to be working on it so that you come to know. For instance, you are talking about this model. So I go to calculate. I go to PLSM algorithm. This is the most important algorithm that we should all be knowing about. So this is a path model. The data is all set up. The data is, uh, there is no weighing factor that we want to attach. Our type of results are standardized so that we can compare and contrast them. And we say start calculation. So I'll just see if there, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about this model and see how it is working. The background is working. That is why it is going a little too. So give it a second so that it works. Now you've got a very complicated model that you see in all the um, uh, literature and your research papers. And we're going to be talking about that model slowly and gradually. So uh, before I make you help you to understand this model, please try and understand these numbers. These numbers are nothing but the correlations between this factor and its item. Remember, this factor and its item in the middle. They are giving you the, uh, if you come here, it is showing an R square value of one. You know why? Because the system is unable to understand, especially when there is a dependent variable. The system is, dependent variable is formatted. The system is unable to understand whether, you see how many arrows are being hit at AGB? That means I don't know whether this one, the R square one, R square one is actually coming from one, two, three, four, uh, uh, lower order construct. So ultimately, at this stage of the model, the impact of or the determining power of ASAT and ACB is not getting uh, reflected at all. Can you see these zeros? They make no meaningful sense. So that is the reason uh, here the model is not working as per my wishes and hence I need to take the model at the second stage. So in order to take the model at second stage, what I need to do is I need to go to the latent variable scores and check the scores and save in Excel. So you need to you need to save copy to Excel. You need to copy to Excel. This is where you get you copy to Excel and you take it to your original database. Where where do you go? You go to wherever your original database was stored. So my original database was here. I talked about alumni giving behavior. I'll open this file. And you will see that my initial alumni database is here. So what, I go, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste it here. So all the data for LSV variables have come here. Uh, this field is redundant. So uh, I just uh, delete it from here uh, this this particular column is redundant because it is just uh, just a primary case just talking about the serial numbers or the row numbers so now i have lsv scores i will now copy paste the file and save as lsv are you there so i 
I already have the LSV, so I'm not saving this file. Uh, uh, I already have the LSV file saved. So if you see, uh, this is my LSV file. Can you see my LSV file? Let's see where is the LSV. Yeah, LSV file for alumni giving. Here I have the LSV file where I saved these uh, latent variables course. So what I need to do is now go back and uh, go back to my to my model. I will first save this model. Okay, let me save this model. It will take a few seconds because it is a big model. So it will take a few minutes. And then I go back to the LSV model. Let it save. So uh, this is where I go back to the data set. I attach a new file. I do right click, import, import data file. Now I have to import my LSV file. Remember, because I had scored my LSV scores. So this is my LSV, LBS data file. I'll just say, okay, this looks fine. Import the data file. And now instead of one stack, you can see two stacks. So I have LSV data file and I also have the alumni giving data file. This was my AGB model, the initial model that I was working on. Now, I will have to rerun the model because I did uh, back, uh, uh, but let me first make the second order model also and then I will explain everything. To you. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to recreate another model. So I go to the right click and I uh, create new PLSM model and I say uh, AGB SEM. So I am creating a new uh, SEM model. Sorry, I canceled. I, we will create a new PLSM model within this only. So I will call it AGB SEM and save here. So you can see that for this particular file, uh, I have now AGB model, that is the detailed model, where all the items have also been mentioned, and this is the AGB SEM model. Now, how do I make the AGB SEM model? AGB SEM model will be calculated on the basis of the latent variable scores. Now, those, uh, what has happened is, uh, every item had a number, right? That is why it was coming in boxes. Now, they, we, run, we ran an algorithm, uh, of PLSM and we actually allocated a number to all the lower order constructs. So what we did was we allocated a number to uh, CGB, FGB, PGB, SGB, AE and C. So when we got numbers to them, now they have now they will behave like indicators. So these indicators or the LSV values are nothing but on the ratio scale. And can I see my LSV values? I can't see it here because the data set attached is the original data set. What I need to do is attach the LBS data set and now I'm, I'll be able to read my LSV values. So can you see these are the two values of ASAT and AE which have now can be seen instead of the circles, they are now appearing as indicators. Why? Because LSV scores have been stored in them. So now they are actually a number. They have become columns. And so uh, they have become easy for me to interpret at the second level. So I will just align them to the left. I also have to talk about uh, uh, AGB, CGB, PGB, and SGB. So this is going to be my model here. I will call it AGB. I will call it AGB. I, sh I, I hope I'm having... All the four, yes, I'm having all the four. Since this was not a reflective model at this stage, so what I will do is I will invert the measurement model. Through the right click, when you do right click, you select AGB, you do right click, you will find this invert measurement model. For invert measurement model, as soon as you apply, this becomes formatted. So initially it was reflective. See, by default, the system takes it as reflective. But if you want to make it formative, 
I invert the measurement model and now it has become formatted. Again, uh, for my ACB, my values were uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 only. They were in the form of indicators, so I don't need to be, uh, be very careful about it. I can just go directly for ACB. And now my model looks better. I will just connect my model to ASAT to AGB, ASAT to ACB. And this is going to be my SEM model, the inner model. I have now come to the level of inner model. If I run my PLSM here, I will have all the details such that. Did you see? Initially, these uh, uh, these arrows had 0 0.00 and 0, 0.00 because their relationship was not getting captured. Also, can you now see 41% R square? That's because uh, now the effect of the indicators and the items and the construct has been done away with by virtue of saving the LSV scores in such a manner that we can make the inner model. So this is our inner model. We save the inner model and we can just create a file. It can even save your uh, data set. Now, I have done both the stages. I have done stage one where I calculated values here at uh, when I was calculating my uh, when I was calculating my uh, lower order constructs, I went up to this particular model. I ran this model to get all values of the uh, of the lower order constructs. What are the lower order constructs here? The lower order constructs are those constructs which are observed directly through the items. So these are my lower order constructs. These two are my lower order constructs. This is also my lower order construct. AGB, CGB, PGB, SGB, FGB is also my lower order construct. So if I just uh, uh, help you to, yeah, now it is visible. Now, there are three things or four things when we are talking about uh, what we need to talk about in measurement model assessments in scale when we are talking about CFA. So please note very, very carefully as to what we are going to say now. Give me a second. Oh, okay. I need to just a second. I need to create another paint file. So eight to cool get a click and talk the up around say. Reflective killer or an eight or formative killer. More for summarizing. Just give me a moment. So now I would like you to understand what we have to do. What we have to do. We have to do reflective measurement model assessments. In other words, we are talking about CFA, confirmatory factor analysis. Now, the first, the first of our construct was ASAT, right? ASAT had two, two dimensions, AE and CA. For each of the dimensions, you need to find out, one, the indicator reliability. We need to check the reliability and validity, isn't it? So uh, what we can do is, uh, what we can do is for AE, we have to check the reliability and also for, we have to check the validity. Similarly, at the lower order level, here we are talking operating on the lower order level. So this was the LOC and this was the LOC. We are operating at the, we are checking the reliability at the lower order level and we are checking the reliability uh, validity at the lower order level. Now, we have already checked the content validity, face validity and all that has already been done. Now we are going to be checking the uh, criteria and the discriminant validity. Now, what do we have to check in reliability? The first thing that you need to check in case of reliability is indicator loadings. 
So what is indicator loading? Indicator loading is the relationship or R between the indicator and the construct. That means if I'm talking about uh, uh, this particular model, this is my indicator loading. So this is my relationship R1 between AE and ASAT AE. This is 0.889 between AE2 and ASAT AE. This is 0.888. This is AE3 and ASAT AE. So indicator loading is actually the relationship between the indicator and its construct. So the outer loading, this is better known as outer loading. Indicator loading is called also called as outer loading in case of a reflective construct. In case of a reflective construct, the outer loading should be greater than or equal to 0 0.708. 0 0.708. Why do we say this? Try and understand. If I have to sum, if I have to square 0 0.708, if I square 0 0.708, the value will be 50%. That means this was R and I do R square. R square should actually be at least to be 50%. The construct should be able to manifest at least 50% of what it is purporting me to measure through the item. Only then our item is good enough. So the first cutoff that we need to understand is that the outer loading should be greater than or equal to 708. The second thing that we under we need to understand is internal consistency reliability. It is called as internal consistency reliability. Internal consistency reliability will be checked on the basis of three factors. The first is called as Cronbach Alpha. The second is called as Hensler's Rho Alpha. Rho, uh, rho Alpha, this is Rho A. And uh, then there is another one which is called as Composite Reliability. These are all composite reliabilities, but uh, I'll just help you understand what is a composite reliability soon. And this is also called as rho C. Okay, so the uh, software will give us these three values. The value of Cronbach Alpha, this is a very conservative measure. And the value should be between the range of 0 0.70 to 2.95. Greater than 0.95 is not acceptable, less than 0 0.70 is not acceptable. Similarly, the same value applies, the range is 0.7 to 0.95. Again, if you talk about composite reliability, it is 0 0.7 to 0.95. These are the criteria ranges that we have to establish. Now, this basically overlooks variances and covariances. So, this is basically a conservative method. If you ask me, the uh, people talk about Cronbach Alpha as being conservative because it is dependent on the number of items. Greater the number of items, greater the Cronbach Alpha. So that is why uh, instead of using Cronbach Alpha, many researchers today, today are also talking about McDonald Omega. So you can go to McDonald Omega. It's a plugin in SPSS, calculate it, and you can find that out. But however, most of the PLSM papers talk about Cronbach Alpha, Hensler's Rho Alpha. Now, this is basically middle of the road approach. This is conservative. This is middle of the road. This is supposed to be the most robust uh, because it is using matrices. It uses matrix multiplication to calculate uh, variances and covariances. It's a very, it's a better approach and uh, it is uh, having more arithmetic accuracy when we talk about Hensler's Rho Alpha. Manually calculating Hensler's Rho Alpha is a tough, tough, tough task. However, Manually calculating Cronbach Alpha and composite reliability is very easily possible because here in this case of row alpha, we are talking about multiple uh, matrices that have to be created. Now, in case of composite reliability, it is a liberal method uh, from the stringent to the middle approach to the liberal method. It is a liberal method and uh, it basically overestimates. Usually, you get too many values, bigger values in case of composite reliability. And it also considers covariances and variances. So if you realize uh, this particular in calculations, covariances and variances are considered. Even in this, covariance, variance and covariance is considered. But in case of composite, uh, in case of uh, 
हेलो यस हाँ जी मैं अभी वर्कशॉप ले रही हूँ आप एक घंटे में काम बात सो द कंजर्वेटिव मेजर डज नॉट इट ओवर लुक्स इट ओवर लुक्स That means it does not take into consideration variances and covariances. So these are the basic three differences between these three reliabilities. Now, what is composite reliability? It is supposed to be a liberal method, but it is a very robust method because it actually helps in uh, calculating reliability, whereby the error variance is also taken into consideration. For example, let us suppose. that we have a model which says the there is a construct say a and uh, there is an item q1 q2 and q3 which are uh, which are uh, which are actually manifestations of a so since we are doing reflective measurement so obviously the arrows are going to go outside so r1 is the r or the relationship between q1 and a let us suppose that r1 uh, the value of r1 is equal to say uh, 0.70 let's say it's 0.70 and let's say r2 the value is uh, 0.80 let's say 80 and here r3 the value is 0.90 0.90 so if you understand the r square values this is this is here this is the dependent variable isn't it because uh, the arrow is towards the dependent variable martha hamesha dependent variable maine aapko bataya tha arrow jis par aayegi wo dependent variable so yahan pe r square value kya hui iska square 77049 uh, r square value idhar hui uh, 8 ka square this is 64 and uh, yahan pe r square value kya hui uh, 9 ka square this is 81 error kya hota hai explained ka matlab explained variance ka kya matlab hai explained variance is r square मतलब 49% ये आइटम एक्सप्लेन हो रहा है थ्रू दिस कॉन्स्ट्रक्ट 64% ये आइटम एक्सप्लेन हो रहा है थ्रू दिस कॉन्स्ट्रक्ट 81% ये आइटम एक्सप्लेन हो रहा है थ्रू दिस कॉन्स्ट्रक्ट इसका मतलब एक्सप्लेन क्या नहीं हो रहा अगर पूरा एक्सप्लेन होता तो वन होता सो वन माइनस फोर्टी नाइन विल बी हाउ मच फिफ्टी और पॉइंट फाइव वन वन माइनस सिक्सटी विल बी माच पॉइंट थ्री सिक्स वन माइनस नाइनटी और एटी वन बी लेट्स टेक एटी वन थोड़ा सा कैलकुलेशन हाँ एटी वन लिखा है एटी वन इज गोइंग टू लीड अस टू पॉइंट वन टाइम अभी देर नाउ द फॉर्मूला फॉर कॉम्पोजिट रिलायबिलिटी द फॉर्मूला फॉर कॉम्पोजिट रिलायबिलिटी इज यू कैलकुलेट सी आर मैन्युअली हम कर रहे हैं हम क्या कहते हैं एक्सप्लेन्ड वेरिएंस का स्क्वायर ओवर ओवर एक्सप्लेन्ड वेरिएंस का स्क्वायर प्लस अनएक्सप्लेन्ड वेरिएंस का स्क्वायर ठीक है तो अब इसमें वैल्यूज पुट करते हैं एक्सप्लेन्ड वेरिएंस क्या था 0.70 प्लस 0.80 प्लस 0.81 राइट का स्क्वायर Over what was unexplained variance? Point five one plus point three six plus point one nine ka square plus what else should be there in the denominator? Again, explained variance ka square. So point seven zero plus point eight zero plus point eight one ka square. So this is explained variance. This is unexplained, and this is explained variance. The value of this will the calculation. Will finally give my value of composite reliability. The value should be such that it lies in between 0.7 to 0.95. If it is greater than 0.95, then there is a multicollinearity problem. If it is less than 0.7, uh, or uh, it is between 0.7 to 0.95, then it is acceptable. 0.7 to 0.9 is still satisfactory, but greater than 0.95 will create a problem, and hence. We say that the composite reliabilities are not in place. So where do we have these composite reliabilities? Let's check on the software. So uh, if you uh, go to the software, you can see reports here. You know, you uh, this is the graphical representation of the software, 
and this is where this report, this particular uh, part of the screen is showing you the report. So these are the outer loadings. These are the outer loadings. Let me make a list of the outer loadings. So these are the outer loadings. ACB to ACB one. 0.864. Then, yaha pe problem hai. Ye dekhe. AGB to CGB one is a problem. AGB to CGB two is a problem. Ye 0.7 se kam hai. Agar hamare outer loading 0.7 se kam hoti hai. तो हम उन आइटम्स का क्या करते हैं अगर तो हम एक और चीज चेक करते हैं वी पुट अप अनदर चेक एंड दैट चेक इज कॉल्ड एज एवरेज वेरिएंस एक्सट्रैक्टेड एवरेज वेरिएंस एक्सट्रैक्टेड अगर हमारी कन्वर्जेंट वैलिडिटी अगर हमारी मेंटेन हो रही है अगर ये फिर भी कन्वर्ज कर रहे हैं तो हम इन्हें रहने देते हैं अगर ये नहीं कर रहे हैं तो हम इन्हें हटा देते हैं वी विल ड्रॉप एन आइटम we can drop an item because this is a reflective scale. Had it been a formative scale at this stage, we would not have been able to drop the item. So what we will do is we will check the validity. Can you see the, uh, these are the Cronbach alphas, composite reliability, row alpha, composite reliability, uh, which Actually, Hensler's row alpha could be composite reliability, ka hai, but row A ka hai jata hai. So that's where it is. Now, if you see AGB ka, AVE जो है 384 है आपको पता है क्यों है क्योंकि ये तो फॉर्मेटिव है तो फॉर्मेटिव स्केल की मेजरमेंट के लिए हम ये सारे चेक्स नहीं लगाते तो अभी के लिए AGB छोड़ देते हैं CGB FGB को हम कैलकुलेट कर रहे थे क्योंकि अल्टीमेटली हम लोअर ऑर्डर मॉडल की बात कर रहे हैं वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट द एलओसीज सो लेट्स चेक CGB LGB एंड ऑल दीज वैल्यूज दीज आर ऑल ग्रीन दैट मींस वी आर गुड टू गो नो वरीज हमें कुछ ड्रॉप करने की जरूरत नहीं है व्हाई because my composite, my average oh, is Can you please mute yourself, Himanshu? Dr. Sunita, please take care of this. Yes, 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 ma'am, please. So when we are talking about what is the value of AVE, AVE value kya hoti hai? AVE value is nothing. But average variance extracted. That means अगर ये R1, R2, R3 था, तो R1 का square plus R2 का square plus R3 का square over how how many number of items three. तो अगर मैं इसको calculate करूँ, I will check AVE value and that means I am talking about 0 0.70 का square plus 0 0.580 का square plus 0.81 का square over three. If this value, if this AVE value is greater than 0.5, then I will not drop. That means my convergent validity is established. So validity is basically of two types. We are talking about um, uh, two types of validity. Here we were talking about convergent validity and discriminant validity. So uh, convergent validity is AVE greater than 0.5. We have to just check this. And in case the outer loading is less than 0.708, yet the average variance extracted is greater than 0.5, you can retain an item. So that is here at all 2022, the primer. And now we need to check the discriminant validity at the LOC level. So at the LOC level, if I had to check the discriminant validity, go to the discriminant validity. There are two ways of checking the discriminant validity. One is the heterotrate monotrate matrix. A heterotrate monotrate matrix is this green matrix which tells us the uh, inter-item correlations and the inter-construct correlations and the ratio of the two. So the HTMT value should be, should be, the value of HTMT should be less than 0.8. And in certain cases where they are very similar constructs, uh, 0.85 is the value, but in uh, similar cases where the, the constructs are very similar, or uh, then 0.9 ki value bhi cheek hai. Ab yaha dekhi hai, ye red value kis ki hai? FGB to AGB. FGB to AGB to hume dekhna hai nahi hai. Kyo? Kyo ki wo to uh, formative hai. Similarly, ASAT, AE to ASAT. Yaha pe panga hai. One se upar ja raha hai. Dekh rahe hai? But, humare ko to lower order ka baat karni thi. तो अभी हमें A set और A E और C A की value तो हम इसको ये कर सकते हैं कि इसमें से खाली A set A E to A set बाकी सब के साथ देखेंगे। So this is 0.723 A set C A and A set A which is fair enough. 
CGB, PGB, FGB with all the other values are fair enough. So our HTMT, discriminant validity at the lower order construct level is established. Now we go to the higher order level or the disjoint approach. We said we have to first calculate the measurement model at the lower level, that is level one. Now I have to go to the level two. At level two, I will again check the same things. So for level two, where do I have to go? I saved on my, um, uh, this is where I made the level two model, where I saved the LSV scores. Uh, sorry, this was level one model. So I saved the LSV scores and I had this as my level two model. Now, if you can see the E and CA, which were other uh, subconstructs have now become indicators. Now I can calculate my algorithm and this algorithm is going to share or tell me about the values. So can you see these? These factor loadings are all greater than point. So let's, let's just go to outer loadings. So outer load, why, why are we not checking SGB, FGB and PGB? Because these are not format, they are formative in nature. In case of formative constructs, we don't check the loadings. We check the outer weights. Are we there? So uh, assessment of a formative construct is absolutely different. So we are going to come to it next. Abhi ke liye hum khali reflective constructs ki baat kar rahe. So for reflective constructs, check ACB. All values greater than 0.7, great. Check ASAT. All values greater than 0.7, great. Our outer loadings wala uh, option is clear. Let's go to reliability and validity. They are all clear. ACB and ASAT. Aap yaan dekh rahe hai, ka nahi aaya. Kyoki for formative construct. Hai. Or formative construct ke liye ye calculations nahi hoti hai. Formative construct ki dealing alag hoti hai. There we check the VIF values and we conduct the redundancy analysis. Jis ke liye mujhe global variable check ho. Have we got it? So what we're going to do is, this is, this is looking perfect. So my measurement model for ASAT and ACB is well established. My reliability validity checks are all in place. And now I need to look at what should be my calculation for my formatted model. Now, if we come to AGB, first we will go to study AGB in step 1. Step 1. Pe. So step one pe to AGB jo tha, uske sare bachche jo the, wo reflective the. So the reflective measurement remains as is. So in case of the reflective measurement, what we are going to do is we are going to check the same things. We are going to check the outer loadings. We are going to check the reliability validity. We are going to check the convergence validity in terms of AVE. AVE greater than 0.5, all set. We are going to save the latent scores. We've already done it since it is uh, working simultaneously for all the constructs. Uh, we save this uh, and we go to the second stage. Now, at the second stage, the dealing of AGB will be very different from the dealing of ASAT and ACB because uh, AGB is uh, basically a, AGB is a formative state. So when I'm talking about AGB, I need to have different sets of checks and balances. So in case of a reflective scale, what do I need to check? A reflective scale, I have to check one, indicator loading. Indicator loadings should be greater than 0 0.708. Then we have to check uh, the uh, internal consistency. Internal consistency is measured in terms of Cronbach alpha, the value should be 0.7 to 0.95. Then we are talking about uh, rho A, that is Hensler's rho alpha, the value is again 0.7 to 0.95, acceptable range. Then we are talking about rho C, which is composite reliability. These both are called as composite reliabilities, 0.7 to 0.95. We also check for convergent validity. For convergent validity, we are talking about uh, AVE, AVE value greater than 0.5, we are good to go. Uh, we can even retain indicators with a lower loading if the AVE is fine. Now we come to discriminant validity. Discriminant validity we tried and checked through the HTMP ratio. So all values should be less than 0 0.8, 0 0.85. So uh, the HTMP ratio should be less than 0 0.85. This is given by uh, Herr et al., 
Territorial 2022 primer. And in case of similar constructs, it can also go to point 0.9. This is gold at all. 2022. Okay, now we come to the reflective measurement, uh, formative. Formative for reliability and validity of the formative scale. For the reliability and validity of the formative scale, the first step that we need to check is outer weights. Unlike the outer loading, we check the outer weights. Here we had outer loading. Here we are talking about outer weight. Now, you need to check whether these outer weights are significant or not. So you apply the significance test and check. If these outer weights are significant, you can just continue. Continue. You are doing well. Uh, they should be absolutely of a relative size. If the outer weights are not significant, then you need to go and check the outer loading. If the outer loading is, is less than 0.5, if the outer loading is less than 0.5 and significant, less than 0.5 and significant, you can only in such a case consider removal of the item. If the outer loading, here we are talking about the outer loading, because significant nahi the outer weight. If the outer loading is less than 0.5 and not significant, then you can delete. If the outer loading is greater than 0.5, keep it even if it is not significant. So let's check. How do we do this? So this was for formative measurement. This is uh, this was for reflective measurement, and this is for formative measurement. Let's check the outer weights. Kya karna hai? Hume isko run karna hai, aur isko bootstrap karna hai. Bootstrap ka kya matlab hai? ये क्या करता है अपने आप ही to check whether there is a significant uh, how the uh, subsamples uh, it creates multiple subsamples with repetition in case of bootstrap and creates a different kind of significance levels जैसे t test का significance और p value निकालते थे ये अपने आप samples generate करता है और significance देता है so this is the significant levels अब आप इधर जाइए we have to check the outer weights do you realize all the outer weights are well in place? The outer weights are well in place. It is perfectly fine. Now we need to go and check their significance level. For significance level, we need to bootstrap. Uh, 5,000, 10,000 pe bootstrap karna chahiye, But for positive time, I say 500 pe kar rahi hu. Uh, it will take some time. Otherwise, you, you have to do it at uh, uh, bootstrap. So, aap ye dekhiye. Ye tino to significant hai, magar isme problem hai. CGB is a problem for me. Now, what do I need to do? If the outer weight was uh, not significant, check the outer loading. Ab mein kya karungi? Iski outer loading check karungi. Outer loading ka jate hai. Outer loading of CGB to AGB is significant. Is significant. So, kyunki it is significant and kya tha? Less than 0.5. Less than 0.5 tha na? So, if we are checking CGB to AGB is less than 0.5 and it is significant, we are safe, we can just continue. So, we are safe, we can keep it even if it is not significant. If it is significant, we have to check our problem. This is the first check of uh, uh, your uh, uh, what is called as a formative measurement. And the second thing that you need to check in case of formative measurement is the collinearity. Collinearity ka kya matlab hai? Hum ye maan ke chal rahe hai ki ye aapas mein related nahi hai. There is no correlation. So, we need to, at this level, the part 2, this is part 1, check outer weights. Second is, check VIF values. Outer VIF values for at LOC level, and inner VIF values, uh, sorry, outer VIF values. We have to check the outer VIF values. So if the VIF is less than 0.5, we can continue. If it is greater than 
or equal to 0.5, then there is something which is called as a collinearity issue. Kya matlab hai? Inke beech mein to relationship nikal aaya. Aap to kya rakhe? Distinct factors hai. Now you need to please reconsider your formative model. You need to reconsider whether it is a formative model or not or whether you should study it on a reflective format. A reflective, like a reflective model. Instead of a formative model, you should study it like a reflective model. So that is where we need to check the VIF values, VIF outer. So let's go here. What do we need to check here? We need to check VIF outer. So uh, can you see the... VIF values will come when we are talking about the outer model. So let's talk about the SEM report because this is a bootstrap report. Uh, VIF values are in SEM report. So this is our SEM report. Is me dekhe, VIF is showing you. Collinearity statistics, VIF. VIF, we have to check the outer model list. Aap ye dekhe, ye sari less than 0.5 hai. We are safe, we are good to go. And hence, we can continue with our formative assessment of this particular model. The third aspect of assessment of formative model. Ye the do aspect, hai na? Reliability, validity, complete karne ke liye. Abhi tak humari reliability checks hoi hai for formative model. The third aspect of the formative model is called as redundancy analysis. Redundancy analysis ka kya matlab hai? Redundancy analysis is a hamari jo formative model hai, wo to converge nahi kar raha na, wo to form kar raha hai. Magar hum ye pata karna chaate hai, we want to know that whatever we have created, it is actually purporting to measure what it, what basically people think about it. Is it actually converging to a single line statement or a global statement if I were to uh, voice out my construct in just one line? So redundancy analysis is a relationship between the entire construct and its global variable. So you take the global variable and put it like a dependent variable, attach the arrow. If the beta is greater than 0.7, we say that there is convergent validity. Have you got it? So all you need to do is, let's go back to the screen of our model. So this is our screen of the model. Let's just find out where we have to go. Yahan pe jana tha hume. Ab yahan pe, is model pe, hume kya lagana hai? Global variable. Dikh raha aapko global variable? Global variable. Achha. To is me mene global variable dala hi nahi hua hai. Koi baat nahi, mein fata fata dala hati hoon. Aapke liye. Taki, uh, it becomes easier. Let me check. Give me a second. So, yahan pe data set mein zaroor global variable tha. I'm sure. Is data set mein check karte hain. Global variable tha ki nahi tha. Yahan aapko dikha hai kahi pe. Global AGB. Ye raha. So, copy this. And, uh, and open a new file. Uh, we need to open the LVS alumni giving file. A wali file thi amari LVS wali file. Anji, ye wali file thi. Is me to hai AG Glow 1. Chal ye dikhra fir mujhe. Koi baat nahi na, isi paste kar. AG Glow 1 paste kar diya hai. We will save this. इसको भी हम बंद कर देते हैं। Let's see this. And let's just let's just come back to the to the model that we had. Where is our model? हाँ, ये रहा हमारा model. अच्छा, ये तो कह रहा है कि glow file है. Actually है. मैंने ही नहीं देखा. I'm sorry. This is the glow file. Can you see it? थोड़ा ऊपर था. मैंने ध्यान नहीं दिया. ये रहा glow. So, this variable ko main yahan le ja ke dal deti hu aur is variable ko dependent variable banana hai. Kya karna hai mujhe? Idhar se lekar idhar run karna hai aur check karna hai. Check karna hai ki beta ki value kitni hai. 
तो बीटा की वैल्यू है पॉइंट एट सिक्स टू पॉइंट एट सिक्स टू का क्या मतलब है इट इज ग्रेटर देन पॉइंट सेवन एंड हेंस अगर मैं ए जी बी को फॉर्मेटिवली भी मेजर कर रही हूँ एंड स्टिल आई वॉन्ट नो दैट वेदर माई मेजरमेंट इज करेक्ट और नॉट सो वट आई डू इज आई टेक वन स्टेटमेंट विच इज द एसेंस ऑफ ए जी बी राइट सो दैट इज माई ग्लोबल वेरिएबल दैट इज द रीजन वी यूज ग्लोबल वेरिएबल वेन वी वर टॉकिंग अबाउट द स्केल द क्वेश्चन डिजाइन सो देर I take that global variable and I see whether AGB in its totality, when it is measured through CGB, FGB, PGB, and SGB, is actually converging, is actually similar to my global variable or not. So when people think about my global variable of giving behavior, I would like to give back to my alpha matter. Is it converging to the statement or not? I have found that eighty-six percent convergence says there is eighty-six percent. correlation between these two and hence we say that the convergent validity of the formative model has been established this is better called as redundancy analysis so we have just completed the entire ball game of what you require to do uh, for uh, uh, reflective measurement and formative measurement for min, uh, multiple uh, for a cfa so you have indicator loading you have internal consistency through rho alpha alpha and R roc you have convergent validity and you have discriminant validity for formative modeling you need to check the outer weights if they are significant you can continue if they are not significant check the outer loading less than 0.5 in sun significant you may consider uh, removal but if it is greater than 0.5 keep it uh if it is uh, check the vif values uh, this is how we go for the vif values less than 0.5 keep it very well redundancy analysis you do it compute through your global variable so this is where we will be using our global so i think uh, that is all that i can cover at least at least uh, as far as the scale is concerned uh, for today uh plsm is a big 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 uh, it's a big world and when i say it is a big world so there are different tools and techniques that we use uh, there are uh, so many uh, you know, there is uh, so many things that we need to do when it comes to uh, plsm we conduct uh, inner model analysis then we do mediation analysis then we do moderator analysis then we do ipma we do nca we run regressions and we run it's it's a big 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 world so um, uh, for now i think uh, what my basic objective was to get you through the process of scale development till measurement model assessments i think uh, time is also up and uh, let's just uh, wait and uh, call it a day and in case i if you have uh, any queries i shall be happy to address those queries so anyone who has any queries can please tell me uh, the queries and we can just then continue yes can we come back yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much ma'am yes participant can put their queries han ji any queries अब मैं इतना अच्छा पढ़ाती हूँ कि आपको सब समझ आ गया दैट्स व्हाई दे दे आर आर राइटिंग द एक्सीलेंट एंड 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 गुड नाइस ऑल दैट ऑफ कोर्स थैंक थैंक यू 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 फॉर फॉर पेशेंट हियरिंग सुनीता जी जी सर हैविंग मी हियर इट वाज सच अ प्लेजर एंडिंग Passed through these two days with a big, uh, big number in terms of participation, and I'm so glad. Even till uh, the last session, people are waiting and watching and listening. It is really great to watch. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. I got the opportunity to extend the formal word of thanks for that. So I would like to extend a very sincere uh, thanks to Professor uh, Pooja Khatri, ma'am. on behalf of commerce department in collaboration with ramanujan teaching learning center 
uh thank you so much ma'am for enlightening us with the various issues like research framework the latent variables and different kind of uh, sampling frames and database literature systematic reviews and etc etc all sessions were very very informative and uh, benefiting even the all participants also i would also express my gratitude to our principal sir professor s p agrawal for his continuous encouragement also would like to thank our program coordinator dr kavaljit sir our teacher in charge dr rajiv nain sir and uh, the ftb convener mr pankaj gupta sir and the secretary dr aarti ma'am and the pranita my co partner uh dr abhay pande and our technical team the complete entire the it supporting system so my sincere thanks to everyone and ma'am your the uh, thank you so much for being with us thank you so much once again thank, thank you, so you much all of you you can contact me even later if you have any queries and if you get stuck in research i agree you will have to practice on your own and uh, take multiple sessions uh, i wish it was a you know usually when we do it in the offline mode it is interactive i would have made you do all this on the system so uh, that is the advantage of having an offline workshop so you actually learn the software you learn how it is functioning you learn what are the problems that you would be facing so looking forward to meet you all offline someday and sure. uh, uh thank you so much for the lovely messages that you are posting and uh, i am grateful to you for the kind words thank you everyone <laughs> all participants for being with us and looking forward for the next session thank you so much take care thank you पुनिया मैम ओवर हो गया यस सर ओवर नाउ ओके मैम ठीक है मैम थैंक यू अभी अभी एंड हो जाएगा सेशन